Yeah. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the Monday, June 27th workshop. Um, first up on the workshop agenda is Eric Cousins from Planning and Permitting to give us an update on zoning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, the Planning Board held a special meeting last Tuesday. Um, <laughs> Yet. Planning Board held a special meeting last Tuesday uh, to take up a number of zoning changes and the reason they had a special meeting is just because with the um, number of project proposals combined with, combined with the zoning changes we've had some late meetings and just trying to split those up over multiple nights rather than um, all in one night. Um, last week the board uh, held a special uh, a, uh, public hearing um, and considered the update of the T42B zoning district, uh, which was a modification of the T42 zoning district that the council had asked for the board to consider, um, specifically for um, application to areas um, like the Court Street area, as well as some other areas that have been um, recommended and considered for T42 zoning. Um, the planning board and the council had uh, indicated that they would like to modify that because there are some differences uh, between the uh, neighborhoods that the T42 has existed in and the, the areas where the T42B uh, would now be considered. The first step in that was to establish a set of standards that would make up the text of the T42B uh, zoning district and we had a some really specific guidance from the council on um, what what uses okay. would not necessarily be appropriate in the areas where we're looking to apply uh, the form a form based code district but not the full uh, permissions of the t42 zoning district as they exist today um, the board um, rec made a positive recommendation um, with some recommended changes to what the council had asked for. Um, the board agreed um, that bed and breakfast establishments could be allowed with special exception approval, uh, lodging allowed with special exception approval, uh, personal services allowed with special exception approval, um, age restricted retail um, should not be allowed, the board agreed with that. Um, not allowing restaurants over 30 seats, um, whereas the T42 zone does allow that with special exception. Government offices um, would be allowed based on the recommendation with a special exception approval from the planning board. Um, parking requirements, um, currently most of the zones that have this allowance, um, you can provide for parking offsite within 1,000 feet, um, reducing that to 500 feet really starts to, um, helps to limit density and the, the area that you could use to access parking around a particular development um, if the development doesn't have room on site for the parking. Um, office service and retail uses, um, the board agreed uh, and recommended that those be allowed uh, within the district, but where the board's recommendation differed from the council um, was that the council had suggested that the board consider allowing those uses only when there's a residential unit on a second story of the building. Um, the board talked through that and they agreed that having the residential component um, where somebody could live and work on the same property uh, made sense to require that residential component but they didn't recommend that we restrict it to only being on a on a second story. So what uh, what that would mean in the text is that potentially you could have a uh, business less than 1,500 square feet in the T42B zoning district um, if the council adopts it the way that it was recommended. But you could have the residential unit either in the same building on the same level. It could be below the business, it could be above the business, or it could be a separate building on the same, same lot. The um, Multifamily uses allowed with special exception. I think that's sort of at the core of the comprehensive plan recommendations and making housing more accessible and allowing for varied housing types um, throughout the residential areas where we have city services. Um, the board did recommend that that be allowed with special exception. And we did have 
a few questions come up about um, with LD 2003, uh, why would it be required to go through a special exception review? Um, currently, state subdivision law uh, requires a site plan subdivision review for any time that a property owner creates three or more units in a five year period. Um, so even if the city didn't specifically say that it required special exception approval, the subdivision law would trigger that if there were three or more units. And we do have the flexibility, and I think it makes a lot of sense, um, because we have a, a robust site plan review special exception ordinance. If there are multiple units in a building, then we do have the ability to apply our special exception standards in lieu of state subdivision law because our ordinance meets the requirements. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, I think, to use those standards for multifamily developments instead of subdivision, um, where we don't have individual wells and soil tests for septic because they are on public utilities. The setbacks of the T42B, as the planning board recommended, um, are um, the board, the T42 zone, and the council had suggested a minimum of five feet to a maximum of 15 feet for front setbacks. Um, the board is suggesting that we use a minimum of five feet as was as <coughs> exists in the T42 zone, um, but to be a little more flexible on the maximum setback in these areas because we have a lot of houses that are already set back further from the road, especially as you get to the more rural areas. The board's suggestion is um, a maximum setback, a minimum of five, maximum of 25 feet or 25 percent of the average lot depth so if you have a lot over 100 feet in depth then the 25 percent of the average lot depth would would dictate the maximum set do you have control of that yes will you roll it so that people can see it because you have all that on here too as well yeah there sorry about that oh so um on the setbacks, so if you if you have a lot the way the board's recommended it over 100 feet in depth and that would yield a maximum setback of larger offer more flexibility for moving your house back further from the road especially in in rural areas whether that's a house or um, multifamily or or a small business less than 1500 square feet um, we didn't have a lot of chance to talk about that I think one thing to think about on that 25% is if you did have a really large lot, then it could, uh, it won't form the street line um, or the buildings up near the street that the form based code envisions. Um, but they're also the um, anomaly or the more rural areas where you have lots that are, you know, generally more than 100 feet deep or more commonly more than 100 feet deep. Um, in the in town built up area, that 25 foot setback would usually hold as, as a max. Any, any questions on that part of it before we move on to the second uh, item that they made a recommendation? Just to hunt it over to uh, Councillor Staples and Councillor Hawes. You all made this recommendation. So at your glance, what are your feelings? Um, uh, yeah, I think that the, the planning board made some good recommendations. I think our initial, uh, probably the biggest one that they changed was the uh, second floor residential on a business and I think that this recommendation makes perfect sense to have a residence in the same lot as the business uh, you know I think I think that's good stuff yeah same I agree with Councillor Staples um, having the multi or having the residential unit <coughs> within the same vicinity is perfectly fine um, I do share the same concerns about the setbacks especially for, for the larger parcels so something that needs to be taken into consideration, but overall, it fits what we were looking for. Dr. Walker. My only concern <coughs> is uh, the, the restaurant, the 30 seats. I don't think there's anybody that could open a restaurant and sustain it with 30 seats. I think it's too small. If, if you take any one level apartment <coughs> house over there, if they wanted to put in a restaurant, it would be big enough to put more than 30 seats in it, I'm sure. I think that's a little, if you were looking to make a living doing this, you need more 30 seats. Look how small Rollies is, for instance, and there's over 60 seats there. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree. A lot of restaurants were about the only one allowed, but I think this is 
mostly geared toward uh, like these market style restaurants. I think restaurants is a pretty pretty loose definition of facility versus a Rollies. We've got Pizza Mark. We've got East Coast. It's more of a to go. It's very uh, um, small cafes, forage market, for example. Those all have under 30 seats, specialty businesses. But again, I think yeah, I don't disagree with you. I'm just trying to clarify the definition. Any other questions? I have a question on age restricted. Just for when it's talking about age restricted retail not allowed, are we talking about any project that is obviously age restricted to purchase? Cigarettes, wine, marijuana. Does it still have to be fifty percent or more of their business, or is it just you can't sell that in the area? So, and we we may want to get more specific in this for this particular zoning district, but it's more than 50% of the floor area is dedicated to the sale of age restricted good. Um, in the discussion at planning board, I was thinking it was more than 50% of the sales. Um, our definition is 50% of the floor area dedicated to age restricted. So, it's conceivable, and the planning board talked through this that. Um, I don't want to pick on Heath Coast, but it's the first one that comes to mind. A convenience store, takeout, kind of a corner store, um, could under that also become a marijuana store in a small footprint under the definition that we have. So we may want to clarify that in the final adoption. Thoughts from the city council on that? I don't know that the state licensing would allow that to occur in the same space, but we can, we can find that out. Well, I mean, we also have to think about the multiple layer approach that we've taken as a city. We now have a 2,000 foot buffer between stores plus schools. So we have schools peppering these areas, and that's a pretty, once you start making the concurrent circles, it eliminates these neighborhoods. Or marijuana, which I believe I, is, in my, in my opinion, from what I've talked to constituencies and what I've heard, that is really what we're talking about. A wine martini bar, small, you know, and cheese, like an old, um, Oh, come on. Austin's. Austin's. Thank you. Like Austin's, uh, I don't think that is you know, what people are upset about. I think they probably like that. It's the downtown marijuana store. And a general retail use is still a special exception. So I think all of those things could be clarified through a planning board review <clears> to make sure that um, an approval is specific to the type of goods that the store is. Eric, could, but, but using your example, could, could a, a, an existing store add age-restricted retail after opening uh, through a regular process without a special exception? I, I think that somebody could argue that they could. I think the special exception review um, could stop that, that we could be specific about the types of goods, but it also, it may not hurt to be very specific that there is absolutely no marijuana store. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see if, if staff had recommendations on what language we could add to this that would tighten that up a little bit. I agree. Yeah. And let's see, first of all, if it's an, if it's an actual thing that needs to be addressed. In other words, I mean, with these 2,000 square foot set-asides, do we actually have to add marijuana, uh, specific language around marijuana? Do we see a map that has the... You know, it's probably a, good time to, probably a good time to review that as well. Um, after that change and see what's happened after we... I, which is to me, if there's any ago. doubt, I'd rather yeah, put no, it in there agreed. that it's excluded. And I do like the special exception. When we have special exception, anytime someone might propose any type of multifamily over three units or a retail, Austin's, um, it has to go in front of planning board for review, community feedback, notification. So there's nothing that can be you know, just handled straight at the staff level. So I think that would probably be, uh, you know, looking at this, and getting some feedback pre-July 18th or during July 18th, some clarification I think might be good on that one point. That's the only point that we're really, that we're looking at, correct? Anything else? Any other questions or clarification? No? Okay. I, I guess in regards to the setback, I'd be interested in how many lots exceed that 100 foot depth and if there are where they're located. Because obviously, obviously um, that would be an issue downtown or in, in the more tightly knit neighborhood but as you get further out of town you know the form base it kind of does fit the form of those size lots in that type of environment so I'd, I'd just be curious if there's any lots that do exceed 100 feet by any magnitude that are within those 
those more tightly knit neighborhoods. Basically, mm -hmm. any lot in excess of 20,000 square feet. Because mm -hmm. after 100 feet back, 100 feet of road frontage, um, plus your house, plus your rear setbacks, you're looking at around, a, it's a 20,000 square foot lot at a minimum, in order to even possibly achieve more than mm -hmm. a 25 foot setback. So, is the likelihood of that is like there could, there will be some, but they'll, they'll not be in town. But it's good to see a map of mm -hmm. it. But it's been, we know. been looking at just doing a query of 20,000 square foot lots or above. Mm -hmm. That way you can then map that out. That should be an easier way to collect that data. I, th I think we can look at where that's the general character and maybe point out some examples. Um, we don't have a data point. We have the maps that have dimensions on them, but we don't have a data point where we could automatically select lots deeper than that. But we could we could find some examples in town, and I think, as you pointed out, the general lot characteristics in town, those are really an anomaly in town in the denser built-up mm -hmm. area. And then they become more common as you move to the perimeter of the area, more rural areas. I think, uh, thank you very much. We're good. Question, oh, you got just a quick question for Eric. Could, on the 25 foot setback, could you look at something like a 25 foot setback or an exception <clears throat> for a lot with topography or other conditions that would require more depth? That way you'd restrict it. To the average of it's the. It's sort of a compromise. To the something. average setback of the existing abutters. Yeah, something. Just. <laughs> We, we do have some zones that recognize the abutting lots and allow that average, so that could be a way to, yeah. to achieve that in character with the surrounding homes. Right. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, first reading on this is July 18th? Yes. yes. Followed yep. by second reading August 1st. Okay. And the, the second part of this was the uh, applying this to the Court Street area, and we included a draft recommendation from the Planning Board. That draft will go back to the Planning Board tomorrow night. Um, they'll finalize any clarifications and we'll forward that, that to you as an official communication on, on the 18th. But uh, in summary, the board was uncomfortable with applying a zone that they don't know exactly what the text will be uh, to the Court Street area. Um, so they've recommended that you not approve that um, until there's an opportunity to know what the text is and then consider <coughs> applying to other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> second, to turn over to the city manager, Bill, for our discussion on ARPA, American Recovery Protection Act money. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, so just a quick update, then a couple projects to bring your attention to uh, as they come uh, to, to us for consideration. Uh, I believe the last uh, second half of the portion of the ARPA funds, if it hasn't been deposited, uh, yet, it will be probably this week. Um, most other municipalities are receiving their second half. So that will complete uh, the U.S. Treasurer's uh, dis distribution of those funds. So that would be the $13.5 million. Um, you, did you did allocate uh, $50,000 for a nonprofit grant regarding recreation. Uh, that was in your packet, just as an update on that. Uh, we have received um, three, and I believe one is pending, um, and of uh, $10,000 awards. Uh, one was to the YMCA for scholarships for their summer camp program. Uh, one was to the Auburn Ski Association. Uh, they were unable to hold their annual ski swaps for the last two years, uh, so uh, 10000 was allocated to them. The Blaze Hoops. Uh, Academy, which is the main basketball club, they'll provide 20 Auburn participant scholarships to attend their summer hoop camp. That's about $500 each for training practices, games, and uniforms. And then what's pending currently is $10,000 uh, for the Auburn Suburban Little League. So uh, that's the current uh, update on those recreational programs that you had uh, allocated funds for. Uh, sustainable Energy, this is the matching rebate awards. We'll continue to give you updates on this. As we, um, as we get periodically, as we get more information. But as of uh, June 23rd, 144 rebates were issued. Um, the state rebo rebate program issued a total of $120,518 in rebates. And so Auburn's rebate program issued a total of $105,000 in rebates. So those are you know, 
well over uh, $225,000 that have gone back uh, to the taxpayers. And the next one is a couple, um, couple projects I want to just bring your attention to. One is the Auburn sewage storage tank. I had a meeting with a couple counselors regarding um, the initiative that's underway of the storage tank uh, with LOPCA. LOPCA had come in and given you an update on that a couple months ago, talked about the need for that storage tank. This is regarding our stormwater separation. I believe you're fully informed on that. <coughs> the uh, uh, Auburn Sewer District took out a $4 million bond uh, to begin that process. That will be over the next, um, the next few years anyway as they uh, continue moving forward with that surge tank um, initiative. The request that came through uh, from the sewer district was that the city would contribute uh, $1.5 million in ARPA funds for this project. Basically, that will decrease the rate increase that will be um, handed down to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to those rate payers, which would be 9.5% is the current rate increase that will begin on October 1st and it possibly uh, a 7% increase in 2025. Uh, if a $1.5 million of opera funds are allocated, that would decrease it to 4.5% <clears throat> this year and then 6.6% 6 .6 in 2025. That's about $22 a year savings with that $1.5 million allocation uh, per a residential sewer customer and for what the Arbor uh, City of Auburn spends on all of our properties, including schools, uh, would be about $2,800 a year. Uh, we have Mike Bar Broadbent here. If you had some questions, too, came from the sewer department to answer any questions. And, uh, and we certainly have uh, Councillor Milks, who's, who serves on that board as well, uh, to answer any questions about that project. But I want to give you an opportunity to discuss that. If that's something that the council is interested in, we can make sure that that is brought back before you. Uh, at a future meeting um, and uh, currently you have um, you'd have uh, we're, we're heading hitting right under just under three million dollars probably in the in the ARPA account currently that's left so so that's where you're at for a balance so question Mike you want to go ahead and come up that, that's correct yeah. left to allocate Left to allocate, that's right. That's certainly not what we've expended. That's what's left to allocate. I certainly appreciate you folks considering this. Uh, as Phil, uh, Phil. I call you Phil, Phil. sorry. <laughs> uh, mentioned we're looking at a 9.5% uh, rate increase in October. If we were to get this, we could reduce that by 5%. 5% uh, uh, rate increase reduction would save uh, about $176,000 a year to all rate payers uh, over the life of our bond for the $4 million, it's a 20-year bond, uh, that would save rate payers about $3.5 million. Uh, so it's considerable when you look at it from that perspective, um, you know, by reducing this uh, by 5%. This, when this rate goes up, that's, that's in perpetuity, that rate increase. Um, so it is a, it's a good way to offset that. Yeah. Questions for Mike or where we're at? Oh, sorry, Matt. When you talk about the lump sum that is paid to, as a savings for taxpayers, as a guesstimate, how much would it save each individual? I mean, I know the rates fluctuate. So it's going to be $22 a year per uh, residential. Uh, our largest customer, which I'm not going to disclose their name, is going to save them about uh, $9,600 a year. And as, as Phil mentioned, the uh, city of Auburn would save about $2,800 a year. But all told, all customers together, it's about 176 thousand dollars a year thank you for those who may not recall this is a, a joint effort that'll be taking place with LOPCA so that means uh, we we're currently looking at about 30 percent of the cost it will be on Auburn um, the 70 percent is on Lewiston for the cost of this storage um, storage containing unit so. Bill, refresh my memory and whatever the council decides if we want to look at this further we need to know what the deliverable date is. Obviously, bonds are being procured. Once you buy bonds, you can't prepay. Well, it's harder to prepay. Uh, what, that's a, that initial cost sharing, 
is reset on a annual basis, I believe? I think every three, right? Three years. Every three years based upon actual contribution of the overall. Storm surge flow. Once we have the new Everett Little built, our, that significantly reduces our storm flow, correct? Correct. So it's going to reset again in 2025, 2026. Our facility opens in 2023. Um, so that means our 30% is going to go down because I believe, again, correct me if I'm wrong, 60 or 70% of our overflow was directly related to the old EL facility. It certainly is a lot. It, but it's also, keep in mind, uh, Lewis will be taking some steps as well. But we, we, would, we would guess that all things being equal, removing the, the old high school off from that and creating the new stormwater separation from the new high school, you're going to see a considerable. I think the question of the council is, oh, excuse me, Mike, what's your, what's your uh, timeline on this for decision making? So construction of the tank is in the next three to five years. Uh, the upfront costs are rolling in now. They're doing geotechnical data. They're uh, doing the design. Uh, we're going to be expending our $4 million bond over the next two to three years. Uh, any contribution that we would get, such as an ARPA contribution, would go into directly offset what we're going to be paying back on our bond. Uh, so again, we would, instead of raising our rates 9.5% this year, knowing we were going to get those funds, um, you know, we would, you know, only do a 4.5% rate increase. What's your um, fiscal year start? Uh, it would start this year. When? Uh, our, our, we're on a calendar year basis, so we start January 1. So January 1, 2023. We, we have to, we're going to vote in July, our July meeting on, on approving the rate increase. Right, and that rate increase will go into effect in October 2022. So you're running on a fiscal year starting October 2022, October 1. Well, That's the, just when we're resetting our rates, uh, but we're, our budget runs on a calendar year basis. Yeah. When, when would we have to turn over the $1.5 million if we agree to this? If you agree to allocate it, uh, we would make sure that those funds were allocated uh, within um, I believe what they're hoping to do is within this within this upcoming uh, calendar year for them, because we want to make sure that all those dollars are expended by 2024. Uh, that needs to be expended for the federal requirement. And you said the 20 year ROI on this, Mike, was was about a four to one. One one point five invested saves rate payers. Right, saves rate payers about three point five million. Yep. So one point five three. Basically, a 2.25, 2.5 to 1 ROI. <clears throat> oh, uh, I mean, from a financial standpoint, and when you're thinking about a tangible ROI versus an intrinsic ROI, this isn't a, this isn't strong. A 2.25 ROI on money invested over the course of 20 years is fairly weak, um, from an investment standpoint. That's debatable, though, obviously, depending on what your priorities are. But, for example, if that $1.5 million was invested in a project that could generate $10 million in taxable value, that would be a quarter million dollar um, annual tax bill, for example, over the course of 10 years, that's 2.5. You know, 20 years and so forth, it, it grows exponentially. Um, that's just quick back of the hand math. So, um, I think it's something to think about. I guess it's up to the council on whether you want to bring this up in a relatively quick amount of time. And if so, there's going to be a lot of planning and you know, comparison that needs to be done to see if this is a smart investment of really what is left of a finite resource. Question on the bond itself. I wonder if that bond could be used for other purposes, because what I'm thinking is rates are going to go up. And so if you substitute this, to reduce the cost of that bond, but then you have other needs that you could shift the bond over to at a lower rate because presumably that's why you did the bond now to get a better rate before they are going up. Have you so done the bond already? Have you secured yep, the bond? You've already purchased a bond. Yep. It's up to the council. If you want to, if you all want to see it, we can go through our, our normal think about this. We, and yeah, we, and I don't need the answer yeah, now. We, can we have a couple of councils that want to bring this forward on July 18th. We can. Okay, very good then. Is there any other questions for Mike? Uh, just real quick, you said that was a meeting in July. What's your meeting date in July? Uh, it's the third Tuesday. I think it's the I think 19th. It's, I think it's the 19th or the 20th. So the council will make that determination by the 18th, which will be before you. That's great. So, thank you. Yep. It's the 19th. 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 Yep. 20th is water. 
Two more that I thanks, Mike. No Appreciate Thank it. You. Two more that I want to bring up to you. Uh, Jay's going to do one in a second. The other one was uh, the Conservation Commission has identified a grant that um, they feel that we should really take a look at, and this is regarding a fish passage barrier removal grant. Uh, they've come to you, and they when they gave you your their update, um, I think it was in February or March. Uh, they they did talk about the Littlefield Dam. And they talked about uh, grant opportunities that might come available, what that would look like, and how we could potentially remove that dam, which would then uh, eliminate that fish barrier that takes place. Um, they did identify a grant writer that could uh, write a grant for us. Um, went back and forth with <coughs> Council Staples, uh, Council Warren, I think, was included in those discussions, um, and Council Walker. Um, it looks like once I took a look at uh, what the uh, fund would, uh, how much the cost would be, uh, it's about $10,000 roughly uh, for the grant writer to go ahead and submit that application. It's by August 15th. I did meet with the finance director. Uh, one that we would recommend is rather than use ARPA funds, originally we were looking at ARPA funds, rather than using ARPA funds, we do have salary reserve funds within this fiscal year that we could go ahead and allocate to secure that grant uh, writer and then go ahead and submit that grant. Um, based on the federal funding that's coming out, we do stand a very good chance of receiving those funds based on how many of these they're looking to remove. Um, and so I think that this is a recommendation that I would move forward with. Um, as long as I don't hear anything um, different than that, uh, we'll go ahead and make that allocation and not use up the funds for this request. Right. Does this have to come back to us in an order? Or you're it doesn't. Your this is something I could just do with you. Ha you allocate funds for grant writing and special um, uh, professional services so I would just use those funds for the grant. How much is the grant? Well, Eric, do you know that what it could potentially be? Part of, part of the effort will be to figure out the budget on this particular grant and it could be in the next or next. And the grant, uh, from my understanding, is uh, non-matching federal funds. So... A true grant. A true grant. So... Um, Removing the Littlefield Dam is that final barrier that's kind of been holding up the works with the upper and lower Barker. And uh, it's an opportunity to remove that for pennies on the dollar here. Um, we just need a, a professional application put in, and I think we can allocate some funds. Yeah, the, what I keep hearing over and over again is this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to get this kind of uh, non matching funds uh, for, for $10,000. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Uh, I'll take the, those steps to make that happen. We'll uh, secure that PO and get that done. Uh, the last one is typically we try to workshop ARPA funds before they come before you. You'll see that this one here is on the agenda. We did talk about it at the uh, early on in the ad hoc work group. We talked about op boxes, talked about being able to um, have good access to the river, recreational access to the river. Um, it took a little while to finally get to a point where we were able to uh, secure uh, an opportunity for one of these boxes to be built. They are in high demand. Uh, Jay has been working with a relationship with Opbox as well as L.L. Bean to bring some recreational activity to the river at Festival Plaza. So I wanted him to give you a, a, just a brief uh, overview of that before you have that as an order uh, tonight. So there's, there's actually two things. There's um, this kayak rental opportunity here as well as Opbox. Um, Opbox, L.O. Bean uses them. The, the state of Maine is, um, they're going to put these Opboxes in all of the state parks and then L.O. Beans or, and other companies supply um, outdoor gear so that the people can rent it out or take it out, that type of thing. So the idea being that um, these boxes can be moved, uh, but there aren't wheels on them. So it's not easy for somebody to come and steal the whole box. So we can put this op box with recreational fishing rods and different things like that, cornhole for when we do a, a brew fest or whatever, um, put it right in Festival Plaza and have it there from, let's say, 
May through October, and then when we get to a point where we want to do the ice rink over at the PAL Center or Anniversary Park or someplace, we can move it over there and uh, again get outfitters to supply skates that we can loan out to people and then um, serve like hot chocolate, that type of stuff. So this first box that we're looking at has multiple uh, uses for it. If you recall our downtown revitalization plan, one of the things that we talked about being able to do uh, was use like storage containers to create like an instant little pop-up village for stores and that type of thing. Our first op box will be for the recreational, uh, but if it works as well as we believe it will and has in other communities, then we can get other op boxes and you can create a whole little community. Let's say, for example, we still struggle to sell the pad site in Anniversary Park, then we can create a little village there and have um, small entrepreneurs sell their wares and things out of that. This, but again, this very first op box is to help us engage the river and downtown as part of our events when we do like our upcoming um, Brews and Blues Festival, that type of thing. Um, people can go down and start fishing, um, that type of thing. The other thing that we came up with is we had wanted to be able to loan out kayaks but that's a fairly labor intensive thing. So we came across this opportunity with rent.fun and what this is is they've, it's a kayak rack that's in a secure cage. Um, people can rent a kayak with their uh, credit card and take it out and use it in, in the river. We've had multiple meetings with police, fire, and Brookfield as well as uh, Jeremy with REC, uh, poking holes in this and talking about what are the liabilities, this, that, and the other thing. We think with signage and a few other things, um, we're all set there. When um, an end user slides their credit card, um, there's an indemnification that happens through this company, so that it's leaving the, the city not responsible. We will still probably have Mike Malloy do an extra you know, some wording beyond that. But so far, uh, police and fire feel they can work with this. They've given us some strong suggestions that we'll follow. We talked with Brookfield. They are not against this at all. They really like the idea. And the way this works is it's about $20,000. Uh, if you get a four rat, four kayaks, it's about 16000 If you get the eight, it's 26000 uh, but that guarantees that the rack will sit there. Our plan is to put it down um, like behind gritties and it's guaranteed to be there for four years, I mean four, five years, and um, you do a revenue share of 50-50 revenue share with the company. The company has to leave it there. If there's not a single kayak rented during that whole time, they still gotta keep it there. And if you're super busy then, um, then, of course, you end up with some level of revenue share. Now, communities our size um, in other parts of the country, when they do this, they're raising um, all together about $18,000 so a year. So nine goes to the community, nine goes to rent.fund. Um, I think this is a great opportunity because I know we had in the past we brought in an outfitter who was trying to rent kayaks and it just wasn't quite enough business. This will give people the opportunity to do it. It's not staff intensive. Um, we can promote this during our various events um, and it really helps us engage the river. So what, what we're asking for for the ARPA funds is they're two very similar things and they're meant, they, they fit right in with our downtown revitalization plan. These op boxes come in different shapes and sizes. This is an example of one that hasn't been uh, branded yet, um, but shows how it can load on. This is the one that L.L. Bean used uh, this past winter uh, when they had their skate rink. Um, 
This is one that's being used in Portland for a pop-up restaurant. Um, this is just showing you, Jen and I went to their facility in Nobleboro. These are made with recycled plastic and uh, they're structurally insulated panels, but they're not like the ones that you're probably envisioning. These are very rugged, very solid panels. Um, so you can't kick through it, you can't break into it. Um, there's I-beams underneath that are made actually out of recycled plastic that have the same tensile strength as steel I-beams so you can pick it up easily. It, it can move with a, just a forklift. Here's an example of a recreational op box. Uh, ours would be slightly bigger and, and would incorporate some electricity so we can use it to like a concession stand. Um, this is an example of how you could do the shelving. I'm going to put the thing here, the shelving, so that it's um, all of these slats, you can change how you uh, put display the equipment in, in the box. Um, I think if we're able to do this, it helps us with our ability to recruit partners to the city because um, they already have working relationships with like L.O. Bean, Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, um, the State of Maine Parks and Rec System. The nice thing is would be the first municipality doing this. These are being used like in Portland for different things, but it's individual businesses using them. So I think it, it helps us with some marketing as well. Uh, and they provide such flexibility that, um, anyways, I should probably stop talking and ask if anybody has questions. I would just add one more thing. Um, so the reason why this is on the agenda for you tonight is for us to, um, because the state is also looking at our box and putting these, uh, we have to get our order in. If we don't get our order in, then we're going to miss a season. And so that's why it's before you uh, tonight and why we didn't have a chance to, to workshop it uh, fully and then bring it on fully to the agenda. Uh, but it's certainly, you know, Project that I think uh, council should get consideration. What's the part? Could you go a little bit uh, in detail about the partnership with LLB on this? Well, we so um, we're still in in conversations. Um, the way we got to get in and really have conversations with LLB Bean was because Opbox was already in a partnership with them, so that's how we got the entree in. Um, our end goal would be that L.L. Bean is doing like the fly fishing school down here on the river, um, that they start doing their, uh, like they already have mountain biking classes and things, and workshops, that they would start doing those types of things at Town Appetite and all of that. It's far too early for me to say, they're definitely doing mountain biking. They're definitely doing this. They're definitely doing that. But the outbox is your, your movable it's, headquarters yes. for these activities. Right, right. And, and what I can tell you from my experience um, working in economic development down in the Roanoke area, we didn't have outbox, but it's not going to be a big challenge getting outfitters to donate some equipment as long as they get to get their label, their logo and things on there. Personally, I would like it to be L.O.B. because it's the main base company and the story with the, where Gritty's is is where the original L.L. Bean store was. So there's all that marketing around it, but, you know, if for some reason they can't do it, it's not going to be a challenge to get Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's. Hear that L.L. Bean? Cabela's. Just, you know, motivate stuff. Well, and I'm not saying that as some kind of, you know. Oh, I will. I will. We will. <laughs> it's a revenue share? That's where the cost us? Well, so the revenue share is with the rent dot fund because that's a, I think it's about, we can set the price. The sweet spot seems to be about $15 to rent a, a kayak, and that's a revenue share. The these op boxes. these boxes, we can come up with a program where we're actually leasing or renting equipment out and all of that, but what we'd really rather do is use it as a way it ties in with our uh, 2019 strategic plan as well as our downtown revitalization plan where it's saying, get people using outdoor recreation, create the connection. So I would hate to put, you know, move it in the winter over to the PAL Center and 
say to the kids, okay, you got to rent this stuff. No, no, but so, how much does it cost us? So the op boxes, depending on um, what we get for bells and whistles, are 20000 but you can get up into fifty and things. But that's, okay. that's, that's if they're doing kitchens yeah. and all that kind of stuff. 50. Yeah. Plus you have the electrical hookup. Right. To set up in the there's, and there's, um, you can have it set up so that instead of a regular key entry, you've got an app on your phone. So we can control that. Um, and the same with the kayak rental. Um, Brookfield would be able to shut down the kayak rental if they have an emergency or something happening. We can shut it down for like the winter when it doesn't make sense. If there's times when there's gonna be high flow, I think we would shut it down every night <coughs> before sunset, you know, and open it up. And it's all remote in time. If this is going to be the first one, with the potential of, as a, this is really a test pilot program, yeah. Yeah. find out exactly what the types of uses are in different areas, you probably want, I would probably think that you'd want this as outfitted as possible, mm -hmm. so it has as much flexibility, right. so you can test out, and then in the future, if we need one that's more specific and at a lesser price, we can do that, yeah. you know, so, the and cornhole what, box. What we did is, Jamie, um, Jeremy put together a spreadsheet for us of equipment that Parks and Rec would like to see in there um, based off of its equipment they don't have plus it seems to be you know in high demand type of thing we share that with the outfitters and then uh, when I was showing you the box and how it's got those it's sort of like the same as your garage system where you hang the panel and there's little slats and you can do whatever so there would be about five thousand dollars worth of equipment out of the gate in there fishing equipment or cornhole or uh, some of these other games and things. So, we, so what was the total amount in the order that's coming up tonight? 100000 was it? 100000 but that what that is is covering the, the kayak, the op box, some of the costs surrounding both of those, um, and then the ability, I do not imagine that this op box is going to be any kind of failure, so we'd be able to then order right after that the next one and this is obviously so there is a this is for you know, people and recreation so yeah. it's a direct benefit to the community mm -hmm. one second there's a potential for an ROI through sponsorships and events right so hard to quantify the kayaks are pretty clear and I think we've had some conversations with other uh, companies that are also looking at like for mountain bikes same thing uh, setting up a rack being able to take a mountain bike be able to hit a trail and so we've had conversations with them, being able to demonstrate that this is a, you know, a project that works well in the community, may be what it takes to get someone to actually uh, decide to go ahead and set their mountain bikes up in the back and even take a mountain bike ride uh, at different locations that they might want to set up. And some of them are set up so that you could take it from one location, use it, and return it to another location. I mean, some of you have seen that set up in other counties. I mean, our our end game would be that. Um, if we get some of the projects and businesses that, that we hope to be able to announce in the next few weeks and months in the downtown area that we get revitalized enough, and in the meantime, we're doing this to, to get interest going, that I would love it if suddenly we were able to, because we had so much business and so much going on, that we were able to take that rack and pull it and let somebody run a kayak rental business. You know, the, the end game is to get it out into the private sector so they can make money. It's just right now there's just not enough business or traffic to do that. So this is a low, um, low investment way to get it started. So you'll have that on the agenda for tonight. We can talk about it a little bit more tonight. If there's any last questions? Yeah? No? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask <clears throat> for, the, for the kayak rental thing where, where you were just talking about possibly having something in the downtown to replace it. I wonder, do you have the opportunity to move this at a different location? Yes. Okay. So this is similar to Opbox. This is screwed into a cement pad so that somebody doesn't just take it away on you. But um, we could move this then um, over to Anniversary Park or to some other, some other area. Um, the other thing, too, that is an option, we talked to the owners of, of this, is that if somebody wanted to actually run a business and we were three years into this, um, that we could hand, we could 
through some paperwork, <coughs> change the partnership over to that private sector person who wants to run a whole business <coughs> and set up there and all that. I have one quick question. Where it's a 50% kind of <coughs> split, mm -hmm. does that also assume 50% liability? No. No. The liability goes with rent.fund. That's what they, when they swipe their credit card, they get the verbiage of that. Of course, we're a municipality, so the municipalities are very suable. So we are talking with Mike Malloy about an additional um, rider <coughs> that goes on top of that. Councilor Moran, last uh, just for clarification, Jay. Um, so we're looking at a five-year lease on rent dot fund, um, and um, what is it? Ot box. Ot box. Ops, yeah. Ot box. Opportunity box. I think that is, is something we would purchase outright. Th this is we would purchase, own it outright. What's the expectation on the lifespan? Do we have any idea? Yeah. So because I've only seen one, and it was at LL Bean, and it was used to great effect. Yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind, so the, the outer skin of those can be designed any way you want. So like the L.L. Bean one, they, just to make it fit in, they did a board and batten. Mm -hmm. uh, but the actual material that's there is like any other styrofoam in the sense that stuff lasts forever. So these have like, as far as the actual panels and all that goes, is over a 500 year lifespan mm -hmm. of it. Now granted your locks, your doors, all those would have to be sure. changed and things but um, this company is about five years old so we don't have the real yeah. knowledge of where that would be. Well when you describe this too uh, I'm thinking of uh, what you've alluded to like with what L.L. Bean does I believe it's called their Discoverer Series Yeah, um, and it's really cool yeah. and it's happening in communities right. all around us. Yeah, An old friend of ours, Mike Henry who's a director of, uh, or the head of the business department at the community college is, is a guide and teaches kayaking through the right. Discover series. Yeah, and so this, this gives us that opportunity to have the equipment there on a regular basis, um, and we can, depending on who the outfitter is that steps up, I mean, I like the idea of if it's L.L. Bean that we, we brand that all about L.L. Bean and everything. We get that cachet of L.L. Bean being in downtown, and then we throw also our seal on there. So mm -hmm. you know it's a partnership. But it, it um, again, I don't want to make big promises about who we partner with and this and that. But this is our entree into it, and our worst case scenario that I see, just based off of my experience in Roanoke, is that if for some crazy reason we can't get L.L. Bean on board. We'll be able to get Bass Pro Shop or Cabela or something. Well, there's a lot of opportunities. I'm yeah. thinking about our friend Leroy over here. He's got a beautiful ice rink they set up in the winter, and if yep. there were, yep. you know, uh, skate rentals Skates, available, right? And you know, so that's what. In and the I like winter, the modular, what, yeah, you know, characteristics. Of yeah, it. yeah. It's something that um, Public Works and us can. Uh, they're able to uh, pick it up, put it on a flatbed truck, and move it. But it's not so movable that your average person's going to run off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like this because it could also be a springboard to do some smaller pop-ups. Yes. Especially around this parking lot mm -hmm. on the other side of the parking lot. Yes. Yes. So, and that's, um, let me see if we've got, they changed their website on me. But they had an example of, um, you get like five or six of these and you put it in like a U shape and you can get um, different businesses to set up, and it's a, a low entry for a business. Um, you can either provide it for free, or the rent is like 100 bucks a month or something. And once they get themselves established, then you try to you know, segue them into a regular brick and mortar um, spot. And so this is something right now, because my charge is downtown, I'm thinking downtown, I'm thinking New Auburn, I'm thinking this area, but that does not mean it couldn't be moved out to Mount Appetite or some other part of the city. As we uh, engage each part of the city, these are getting <coughs> Or even Platts Field or Great Falls Plaza. That right, would be a right. Great spot. Yeah. So, thank you. So we'll have, we have obviously more discussion during the order time. Um, so we'll move on. But lastly, order 
if upon approval by council, when is delivery date? So we would, our goal would be to get them in mid-August so that we can do a actual big splash grand announcement during the September 10 Brews and Blues Festival. Um, so people can use the kayaks and use the fishing rods. And so the right kayaks out. will be also available by end All of summer, of midsummer. According to just our, just before I left for vacation last week, that was the timeline. And they said, if, if you tell us that you're ready, we can do these in six weeks. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll talk more uh, when it comes up on the agenda later on this evening. Okay. Next agenda item. Or is there anything else on ARPA, Phil? Uh, that's it on ARPA. Okay. So next, we're talking about street trees. We have Public Works Director Dennis Doytel. All right, so Dennis is going to come up. I asked Dennis to come just to talk about it. His department will be the one that will implement this. One thing that's in your packet under the workshop, you do have a couple policies. I wanted to demonstrate that uh, Public Works has policies that dictate the workload uh, and efforts that they do regarding um, uh, dealing with uh, Trees, shrubs, uh, all that work. Dennis, can you bring that up? Can you just scroll down to the next item uh, after this? And um, the ordinance you've had you had a discussion on this already. The street tree ordinance. Dave Griswold came in, gave a presentation along with Councilor uh, Staples. This also went to the uh, Sustainability Board. Uh, they uh, took a look at this, provided some really good feedback. I thought. Uh, with some of the discussion that took place there. So this ordinance is coming back before you uh, for consideration. You allocated in the budget about $25,000 towards uh, uh, street trees. And uh, the initiative there would be that we do have several things that are impacting the community as far as ensuring that we are replacing our, our, uh, our trees that are on our streets, um, how that impacts development, what that requirement will be. Uh, this ordinance takes care of that. So, Dennis, I don't know if you want to hit some of those highlights. <clears throat> sure. Um, so, in, it, thank you, uh, City Manager Kroll. I think that he covered the the ordinance components. I think that the ordinance does provide us with um, one the requirements of maintaining an inventory. This is something that you'll see if you looked at our packet. We did provide those policies. That's something that we already do. Um, but by providing this, I think it does take it, I guess, to another level of maintaining that inventory that information that data so that we we can provide a more sustainable um in, uh, excuse me street tree uh program um it, one of the one of the aspects uh two policies like i said that I included one is our actual maintenance of street trees how we maintain those the proper way to do that all of this work has also included the forest board over the years i, I want to certainly recognize their work in this because it's been very helpful to us building our own arborist program over the years has gotten better and better with their support and, and, and engagement. Um, and then I think this ordinance just continues to build on that. Um, so we have our maintenance uh, uh, SOP, on, is again, how we maintain those. But the other SOP that we included in there was our asset management um, SOP. And this is, so we consider trees an asset to this city, um, just like any other asset. And it requires a maintenance plan and a program to make sure that we get the longest life out of those trees. We're getting a a return on that investment, so to speak, of making sure we're not putting trees in and, and not maintaining them to, for their long the longevity and getting the most benefit in terms of quality of life improvements and um, beautification of our city in that. Um, so the asset management component is, is critical. Um, I know you've heard about it. We have a uh, major asset management uh, project that we are kicking off. Um, I did review back in March, you got an update uh, on this discussion, and, and back in March, I believe, uh, Dave uh, Griswold provided the, um, we had 5,739 trees uh, inventoried back in 2018. The reality of the asset management and why I shared that, why I think it's important we had it in there, is we haven't updated that inventory in four years. And so the reality is we don't have accurate data, and I think that's part of that asset management, is to bring that up and maintain that going forward. So again, we're making data-driven decisions around our trees or whatever those assets may be. But certainly for this conversation, we want to make sure we're putting the money where it needs to be in, in the appropriate place. So those are our policies. Again, I think that, that support that. And I think I'd open it up to, to questions or, or concerns. Probably the final thing, and I know you've already had this presentation, but um, final thing would be that staff has reviewed the ordinance internally. Uh, there's no recommendations for any changes with Councilor Staples, you're the driver of this. Yeah, Thoughts sure. on outcome? 
Yeah, yeah. First, I'd just take a minute to thank Dave Griswold for his leadership on this. I mean, it's just he's he's been really helpful, and just thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like the, the ordinance that we've created here. Um, the thing that to me stands out the most is that it gives a, a mechanism for funding street trees that I think was possibly missing uh, in the existing ordinances. Um, so at the end of every year, uh, the arborist would take a, a stock of, of lost street trees and budget for those replacements uh, in the next budget cycle. Um, and that, that continues. Uh, that's how we're going to continue the, the, to maintain our, our stock of street trees. So I, I think that's probably the most important part. So, Mayor, uh, no other questions. This will go to uh, the city attorney for a final review of any ordinance before you vote on it. Uh, the attorney will kick that back to us. And as soon as I get back that, uh, get that back from Attorney Malloy, I'll make sure it's on the next agenda. Item. Awesome. Thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Brian Wood, Assistant City Manager. We're going to talk about public safety and an update from the previous workshop. I have a feeling this is going to be pretty much a monthly, if not bi-weekly, occurrence <laughs> going forward. All right, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a follow-up to our discussion at our last, um, at our last workshop. Um, so one of the things that um, we discussed and that um, you guys charged us with was uh, coming back before you to kind of talk about the ROI, the return on investment, um, what this would look like for, um, for some of the taxpayers um, what this would look like um, in the broad scheme of some of the development um, that we are looking at moving forward. Um, and so um, the team, the staff all dug into what that would look like. Um, and so one of the things, and just kind of a really brief recap, um, what was presented at the last workshop was um, a, a uh, robust articulation of the work and how we um, started the process around public safety uh, building and how that originated all the way uh, going back to um, PD, moving to City Hall uh, on a temporary basis. Um, was it 12, 12 years ago? 12 or 13. 12 or 13 years ago. Um, and so uh, not quite so permanent, um, but here we are. Uh, and as um, we're looking forward into the next um, 50 years since uh, Central has been around for 50 years. Um, what would that look like for the city of Auburn? What would that look like for um, our public safety buildings? Um, so with that in mind, um, one of the things that we asked ourselves was, um, and, and that council and mayor asked us was, um, what would it look like, uh, or what would the city need to do in order to keep uh, the mill rate uh, kind of flat? Um, and so, uh, um, so here are a couple of, um, examples or offsets that we looked at. Um, and I think there was a general consensus uh, last time around option one. There were four different options um, that were presented um, or just uh, discussed. Um, option one um, was truly the option that I think encompassed really all four buildings, if you want to think about it like that. Uh, it had engine two um, was a completely new building. Um, engine five was major, major modernization. Um, upgrades and then um, I think what's helpful to think about um, the public safety building um, where Central currently is is almost thinking about it as two separate buildings um, that are going to be joined together that will allow um, obviously economy of scales in terms of savings um, but if we were to go out um, and build one building today and one building tomorrow um, you're going to see obviously a significant increase in cost um, so when we think about this uh, large price tag, if you will, at, at $47 million, you're really thinking about four different buildings. Um, so I think that that's helpful to think about as well. Um, in this uh, dollar amount as well, uh, there is um, the assumption that uh, none of the additional offsets that we know to be true um, are taken into account. So this is if 
um, the current taxpayers were taking um, all of these costs on themselves. Now we know um, we have already secured uh, $2.5 million in federal um, grant and support, um, or federal earmark, um, which would go towards this project. Uh, we also know in option one, uh, the 911 center is uh, located in this new building, um, and we would expect and anticipate that that cost would be, um, if they do in fact stay um, in this new building, that that cost would be split between us and Lewiston. Um, so right there, just those two pieces um, would take the price tag from 47.8 million down to around 43.8 million. Um, so already, um, when we talk about the offset with TIF and offset with um, realized valuation, those numbers would be a little bit lower. Um, so what would it look like if we wanted to um, offset the entire cost of the mill rate, um, assuming no growth um, within the city, um, we would need to see approximately um, $208 million um, in, in offsets with TIF. Now, TIFs are unique because, um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, there's the ability to set aside 15% um, in TIF districts towards uh, public safety buildings and, um, and spending. Um, so that's why this number is uh, so much larger than, um, than realized valuation if we were looking at just um, at, at just the uh, residential side of things. Um, that also takes into account the reality that when you TIF something, um, the sheltered amount um, requires you to take into account other um, non-governmental entities. So library we're taking into account, or governmental entities, the schools, um, all of those other um, entities that we share revenue with. Um, so there would be a little bit more that would need to be made up um, if we wanted to offset that entire amount with TIFs. Um, option number one uh, would also require about $180 million in realized valuation. Um, as you, I think everybody knows here, the market is changing <laughs> daily um, and increasing quite a bit. Um, and so I think the mayor did some really rough math, but that would be about 400 new homes, which... Um, is definitely not outside the realm of uh, possibility or likelihood um, at all. Uh, and that's, again, not taking into account any of the uh, proposed projects that we anticipate are moving forward, anything from uh, BJ's, um, I think approximately 180 uh, units there, um, and a number of other smaller projects that um, are, are moving through the pip pipeline. Um, I think it's important as we talk about these numbers, um, just making sure we're talking about um, assessed valuation versus permitted valuation. I think every year, or at least the last four or five years, we've been on an upward trajectory of permitted valuation um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 million north. Now, obviously, that's not a one-to-one -one ratio, um, depending on the project, and obviously a lot of that's also on the commercial side. Um, but all of that said, I think between um, TIF offsets, which we are uh, currently um, exploring a number of new projects that might have some um, TIF components um, and in realized valuation in new housing uh, opportunities. Uh, and this is not taking into account um, any additional growth on the commercial side, which we also know and anticipate that there will be some growth on that side. Um, that's kind of what those numbers would look like now. Um, Obviously, there are some of the unknowns, uh, the assessments, what that's going to look like, um, the different types of bonds uh, that we might use to finance this moving forward. Again, changes in the commercial sector, revenue sharing with the state, which has uh, dramatically uh, increased, so that's helped on the budget side. Betty, Homestead. Um, so there's a million and one variables, and I think when staff really started digging into it, um, you know, obviously those that are steeped in it uh, every day quickly said, there's too many variables, I can't give you a, a finite um, or a specific answer, um, but so we really wanted to speak with um, about some of the broad strokes and trends as what we would need to see to, um, to help with some of these offsets. Quick question before we move on. Yeah. Is that option one, 
TIF offset and option one with realized valuation, or no. is it either or? Either or. Okay, thank you. Either or. Sorry. Right, but I just wanted to make sure for clarification. Yes. That's or, not and. No, we don't need $388 million to offset it. <laughs> either or. Although I'd love to see $388 million in valuation. I'd be all right with that. Um, so how does this com uh, how does this compare uh, with, I think we also talked about, if we do nothing? Right, um, and so we put our heads together and thought about what are all of the elements that we would need to take into account over that same 20 year window um, of the bond period and what would the cost be associated uh, with that. And again, these are rough uh, ballparks. This is not taking into account any of the unknowns, which inevitably over a 20 year period is going to happen. Um, but one of the things I think that we often um, may not think about, and I think uh, Chief Chase has spoken to this before, um, but really when we talk about the dollar amount associated with um, the efforts to keep our uh, firefighters, our men and women safe, um, <coughs> there's actually a real dollar amount in terms of workers' comp. Um, some of the legislation at the state level uh, presumes um, a number of things, and one of which is uh, the presumption of uh, cancer um, based off of the, the job and the hazardous material. So the chief has done a phenomenal job um, in terms of going out, finding grants, uh, finding opportunities to, to mitigate that. Um, but at the end of the day, there are just certain structural uh, <coughs> challenges that we can't overcome um, just based on the age and the structure of, of some of our buildings. Um, so assuming that even some of our, our new firefighters um, worked at Engine 5 or Engine 2 for a period of time, um, let's say we don't go out to bond for that until 2030. Um, the, because of the structure of it, because of the age of it, um, there would easily be a presumption of uh, responsibility if any of them uh, were to develop uh, cancer. And, and uh, Phil and myself were just sitting on a, a call earlier last week. Um, and, and, you know, these claims are real, and I think we all, you know, want to do what's right by... Um, you know, our men and women that are, um, that are working in these fields. So um, that's one piece if you wanted to put a dollar amount to it. Um, lost federal funding, obviously we talk about the earmark, uh, that $2.5 million. Uh, we would not be able to um, move forward with the project with uh, Central as is, uh, because the moment we started to touch Central, um, we would have to undergo a major renovation, um, which would then be uh, millions of dollars just to bring everything up to code, ADA compliance, we'd have to install an elevator, all of these things I think we talked about a little bit um, at, the last, uh, at the last workshop. Uh, staff relocation cost, um, we spoke about this, but obviously um, one of the challenges with uh, PD being here is they take up two floors, <laughs> and so um, obviously it's not an optimal design for them. Uh, but it also does uh, dramatically infringe on um, some of the other services that are here. We've already had to relocate some staff. Um, and so assuming that that continued, um, that would also be um, a cost that would continue. continue. Um, engine 2, at the end of the day, there's no way around it. At some point um, in the nearer term, uh, that's going to have to be replaced. Um, it's just not a viable uh, station as is. Um, or for the foreseeable future, there's not enough renovations that we can do that will make that, um, that will make that engine uh, viable for another 30 or 40 years. Uh, HVAC replacements at Central, uh, I think we spoke about that and you've saw, seen that in uh, the HVAC assessment. Uh, energy efficiency uh, savings, um, Central 5 and 2, uh, no matter how much we want to renovate them. Um, and how much money we spend in there to, to make them energy efficient. Um, the structure and design of them just is not um, as energy efficient as it would be in a new building. Um, so that's opportunity lost. Um, and then one thing that I don't know that we've thought about um, a great deal, but um, PD takes up a little more than 35 uh, parking spaces uh, in our current garage. Um, each one of those spaces has a cost. And as we're talking about some of the economic development that we want to see downtown, um, we're talking about a number of the new businesses that we want here. Um, one of those pieces is uh, parking. And one of the 
um, designs and, and ideas when we originally built the garage um, and that we would expect is that that would be available for the public um, to use. And that's obviously not going to be the case. Um, even if we move PD around, um, there's still just limited spots there. And so those costs um, are going to be shifted to um, the developers, which would then come back to us in some form or fashion, whether that's a credit enhancement or it's some other offset to um, make up for those um, spots that we don't have access to, not to mention the operational um, inefficiencies uh, by leaving them where they are, even if we did move them up, let's say, on the third or fourth floor, not to mention, I don't think they would uh, be a huge fan of that. So um, all of that to say, and these are just, um, I'm sure there are even more uh, costs that we have not accounted for, but um, to stay as is, we're looking at 13 to $16.3 million. Um, so when you take that from the uh, true number of at least uh, 43.8 million, uh, once you've taken into account uh, the earmark money and uh, split with Lewiston, we're really talking about a delta of $27.5 million um, for four buildings. So if you break that down per building, that's about a little less than $8 million. Um, I think uh, some of our uh, members on the ad hoc committee uh, and, and I think Councillor Lanning went out to Brunswick and saw what they uh, recently built for 13, 13, five, 14 million dollars. Uh, that was just one fire station. Yeah, that was just the, fi the fire station and they yep. had not too long ago built a separate police station. And right. they're both on Route 1, which is high value real estate. So their costs are not only high for the, for the two stations, but then losing yeah. tax revenue on valuable Street frontage on Route One, so Absolutely. I think this is a smarter way to go. Certainly. Absolutely, and we are continuing to look at um, and explore other opportunities as well. Um, uh, we, uh, Andy Titus, is on our ad hoc committee and, and sent uh, an email this uh, this weekend um, saying, you know, are there opportunities for um, some additional partnerships and grants with the state for locating uh, the county emergency management agency or some uh, additional opportunities there. So, I mean, there's gonna be a number of opportunities that we continue to explore um, throughout this to continue to try and help offset um, some cost. Uh, I think the uh, committee has really driven home and you'll see in the final recommendation from the committee um, a really um, strong emphasis on um, looking for other ways to offset the cost and looking to make sure that we're really um, being realistic in um, what some of the growth projections are going to be. Um, but I, I think we've definitely done that. Um, and the Chiefs have uh, really dug in to each and every uh, inch and nook and cranny um, to shave down, uh, and make sure that this isn't a, uh, viewed as a, as a Cadillac. I think the Chief is, I think both Chiefs have, have articulated that um, any smaller or any, any less, and, you know, we're, we're going to, uh, really be doing ourselves a disservice and is almost going to render it um, non-functional before we even before we even move in. Um, so. Oh, and just so uh, with that, uh, Chiefs, have anything they would like to add or any, any additional questions? I would just say, Council, Mayor, and also for the public listening, we will be uh, setting up um, some public information sessions regarding uh, this uh, in the near future. So you'll be, um, the team here will be taking this out on the road, their <laughs> presentation. Uh, we want to make sure that's a good opportunity for the public to uh, take a look at the, the renderings, uh, have conversations with uh, the team, the uh, committee, and, uh, and certainly the staff that's been part of this as well. So they can get a really good understanding of, of this project. There's, it's very complex. We've got a lot of moving pieces with this. When we talk about um, three fire stations and a police station, and then what are the what are the other opportunities that come um, as we continue? And we'll have more conversations with the city of Lewiston uh, when it comes to the dispatch center. I've already had conversations with uh, the city administrator, and there are some other options regarding dispatch with uh, space that Lewiston has over in Lewiston that we'll explore 
and, and consider that. Um, and as uh, Councilor Titus, I think, brought up regarding county emergency management, you know, depending on what takes place with the sheriff's uh, department, uh, the sheriff's already stated that there's no room for county EMA in that space. And so that is something that we should probably explore and take a look to see if there's space for us, uh, for them rather, in, in our <coughs> facility, how we can do that. That's a good partnership, a good collaboration with the board. And, uh, and one last thing I would uh, say, and I think that this was a really salient point um, that we took at our last ad hoc meeting. Um, it, the uh, engineers were, were speaking and they said, you know, the only thing, the only buildings that are more complex, uh, challenging and costly um, than what we're talking about here are uh, hospitals and, uh, and prisons. Um, and that just really, I think, highlights um, the complex nature, the, the unique nature of uh, buildings such as these um, that are really specific um, for purpose and, um, and and need, and so it's not um, it's not as sim simple as I think uh, some other um, government structures may be. So um, I think uh, both chiefs and, and the ad hoc committee and staff have really done a, a tremendous job, um, you know, putting this together and, and really kind of working through each and every um, element. So. Well, I think the the big takeaway here for us to think about and ponder is. The ability for us at our current trajectory of growth to not impact the taxpayers of Auburn is strong. Um, it's not just, you know, as this council, previous councils have uh, been told before, oh, we'll fundraise X dollars or do this to offset. No, this is legitimate math, doable. Trend is already there. So, okay, so it's, it's attainable. And I think that's important for us to balance out the wants and needs of the community with the desire and ability. So. Gives us something to shoot from. And, and just to clarify, both chiefs feel like there's growth, there's room for growth in, the, in this investment. Yeah, I think it's a sensitive balance between right sizing um, and growth. Uh, from our perspective, you know, we talk a lot um, that it allows us operationally in, in our in our department to have some flexibility, if you will. And um, but there's also there's still the potential, depending on where growth pops up in the city. I've said. You know, us our, our scaling, and we're talking, you know, in the five and ten year window out, um, there may be the need for an additional substation because of geography, not necessarily because of, of size. Right. We, we need to do, deliver our service in a different way than PD. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll let the Chief speak to that because our location is, <coughs> depends. So, uh, our ability to provide a timely service is so much based on our location. Um, but, but for what we're, with our current model and the way the city is and the trends that we've got, I think that this meets our needs. In, in a practical way, pragmatic way. Yeah, that's a great point, though. I mean, population is one thing, but 65 square miles, an area mass larger than Portland, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and Westbrook combined. Right. So if you think about what their public services um, outlay is, so to speak, compared to ours. I would guess if you're, if, if we were to, this central, yeah. And you put another fire station out in yeah, somewhere right. else. Yeah, right. I'm a firm believer that, you know, the best delivery models for such a geographically diverse city as we are is to have one and two company stations in the right locations in your city, right? So so Central needs, I think, even in moving into the future, needs to be able to accommodate um, those two companies, your admin staff, and then support equipment. Mm -hmm. But that as this, your city grows, if it grows geographically, you might have the needs for other, other things within the city. And I think, uh, you know, this uh, allows us to plan for the future as well. Uh, it, this does allow us some growth. Um, <clears throat> and we've talked about projections for the future as population grows and service demands change. And for this site, it uh, is centrally located within the city. Um, we're not as location-based re reliant uh, due to the equipment we have in the cars and a lot of things we can do right from the car. And, you know, we also talked about in these substations, uh, adding in office space for PD to be able to go there and work and stay within their response zones. So, but looking forward to the future, this really, you know, meets our current demand, but also allows us that growth potential as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, we're good. That's it, Mayor. You get a little break before the meeting. A little break. Six minutes, we'll reconvene in the council chambers. Thank you very much, all. Appreciate it. Thanks, <laughs> The clouds, the, uh, the, the artistic rendering has something. Thank you for it. I don't know if they're doing a lot of police and fire.
Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here for our June 27th regular City Council meeting. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first on the agenda tonight are the minutes from the June 6th regular council meeting. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Motion to approve is second. I got a motion to approve. I have a second from Councillor Walker. All those in favor? Approved by a vote of 7 0. Next is communications. Uh, any council communications? Start off to my left. Councillor Staples? Uh, nothing at this time. Councillor Walker? Nothing at this time. Council Morin. Nothing, thank you. Council Milks? Nothing at this time. Councilor Oz. Councilor Whiting? Nothing at this time, thank Count you. Councilor uh, Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick update about the community <clears throat> gardens, especially Newbury Street. Even though because of family illness, I haven't been able to, to garden like I'd like to. I, was, I stopped by the other day, and there's a lot of people that put an awful lot of hard work, and it looks like it's going to be a bumper year for the vegetable gardens. Okay, Mr. Manager? Uh, nothing. The only thing I'd like to report is we are hosting two community conversations, um, one being July 12th at 5.30. That will be held at Walton School. The second one will be July 13th at Fairview School in the gym. Uh, Walton will be in the cafeteria. The purpose of the conversation is a 20 minute, or excuse me, is zoning and its practical application uh, to our downtown and suburban areas of the city. Um, approximately be about an hour and a half, consists of a 20 minute presentation to bring everybody up to speed, followed by questions and answers, and then individual conversations with myself and any counselors that are there. Uh, so I encourage everybody to get out there. There has been some press about it. Um, and please keep talking about this within your neighborhoods so we can have and engage civilly the public in this uh, pretty significant change. Next open session, first open session of the night. Anybody from the public who'd like to speak, please come to the podium, give us your name and address and limit your comments to approximately three minutes about any topic of business that is not on tonight's agenda. Scott Berry, 179 Davis Avenue. Mr. Mayor, distinguished council members, I'm here tonight to finish my statement about the acreage near Lake Auburn that will be changed from agricultural zone and resource protection to a mixed use zone. The last time I was here, I tried to explain how a septic system functions for those who had no idea how a septic system functioned. I hope I did a good job of explaining. I also stated that I would post a short video for those who were curious about septic systems, and I did sponsor a video on Facebook and garnered over 4,000 uh, uh, accounts within two weeks' time. I hope some people gain some kind of insight about how a septic system functions. I would like to share three experiences that I came across with three failed systems. I am in real estate, and I've been, I'm going on my ninth year. We ca I came across three failed systems, and from them three failed systems, each house had a well. The wells were tested. The well did not fail. There was nothing wrong with the wells. The septic system did what it was supposed to do. It would be the same around any lake. The state of Maine has a 250 foot buffer zone around waterways. And that, I believe that's what we've got here. Well, we've got more than 250 feet down by the Lake Auburn. We're gonna change the acreage. And that's what I guess that, but I want everybody to understand that the wells did not get to get contaminated because the septus failed system. 
I would like to voice my suggestions as to what the planning board could require the developer to do when and if they come before the planning board. Test wells could be placed at the property boundaries closest to the lakeside and monitored periodically from time to time upon the wishes of the planning board. The board also could require the developer to set up an escrow account to pay for the test for so many years. I know Auburn doesn't like to charge contractors money, but from where I come from, contractors do pay, pay their fair share. The planning board could also require that the developer set up an association for the sole purpose of monitoring the individual septic systems when the development to ensure that there is no failed systems. Sorry, you're at your three minutes, sir. Excuse me? You're at your three minutes. I'm done? Well, you, yeah, everybody's at okay. three. But I will say, if you have something written down, please, we'll give it to the clerk, and we can look at it at a latter point. Too. Okay, thank you. Okay. No, no, thank you very much for coming and speaking. If that's a sugar loaf vest, no. Sugar loaf. <laughs> we'll let it slide this time. My name is Jim Lynch. I'm a resident of 80 Shepley Street, along with my wife, Jennifer, who is present. And as a resident of Auburn, I have some concerns about this current change in residential neighborhoods. I'm concerned about the development of multi-family units, up to 14 units per acre. I'm concerned about services, personnel services, such as a tattoo parlor or a hairdresser. On Shepley Street, they narrowed the street by four and a half feet 10 years ago for drainage, for rain drainage. And when we have a garage sale on Shepley Street, if they park on both sides of the street, it's very difficult to maneuver th down the middle of the road. So, you know, Shepley Street being a part of this T4B, I have a concern of development, of the development of the neighborhood, where it may be encroaching, I feel, in a residential area where we enjoy the pursuit of happiness in our own neighborhood after a high day of work in a commercialized area. It's nice to come home to a quiet neighborhood. And I think a lot of my neighbors feel the same way. Thank you. And I encourage you, if you can, so we can have a, we can't have a dialogue with city council during public comment. So we couldn't like try to ascertain or help you answer some of your questions. It's just the rules of the council. Yeah, every day I'm just making a but, comment. No, no, no. I get, but I mean, this, these are great talking points. And if you could show up to Fairview on the 13th, I'll be there. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry about the audio. We're trying to fix it. Anybody else in the public? No, close this open session. We'll move on to new business. First on new business is order 89-0627-2022, amending order 68-0606-2022, previously adopted by the Auburn City Council on June 6, 2022. Regarding the first council meeting in July, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Council Staplers, second Staples. <laughs> second by Councilor Whiting. Open this up for public for comment. Basically, this is just canceling our meeting for July 11th, uh, excuse me, on July 5th. Um, and so our first scheduled meeting will be July 11th. Okay. Any member of the public like to speak? None being, I'll bring it back to the council. Council? Nothing? I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? None being? <laughs> Passes 7 0. Next is order 90-0627-2022, approving the mass gathering request for the Liberty Festival scheduled for Monday, July 4th, 2022. This is a public hearing. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Councilor Gary, second from Councilor Milks. Open this up to the public. Public. This is in reference to July 4th. It's Independence Day. I forget everybody knew that one. Council, questions? Glad to see it happening again. Anybody here from the Liberty Festival? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, just so we know, we did allocate money annually. We have been uh, for fireworks, and we're a big sponsor promoter. And uh, thank you for getting this done. Thank you. All those in favor? Seven zero. Next, order ninety one dash zero six two seven two zero two two, authorizing the city clerk to waive the sixty dollars business license fee 
It's a temporary food service license fee as requested by an Auburn resident, Beth Woodhead, who would like to sell whoopie pies to raise funds for the Auburn School Department's Odyssey of Mind. Odyssey oh. of the Mind, excuse me. Motion to approve. Second. Councilor Second. Councilor Morin. Open this up to the public for comment. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? And I'm being bring it back to the council. Council, anybody want to deny a fundraiser? I didn't think so. All those in favor? <laughs> Seven zero passes. Next is order 92-0627-2022, which is adopting the home consortium agreement. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Councilor Staples, second by Councilor Walker. Open this up to the public for comment. This is an annual, just as a little background, this is an annual agreement. Excuse me. Oh, every three years. That Glenn Holmes is going to actually go into a little bit more detail so we all know. So historically, um, the city of Lewiston and Auburn have had this agreement. It's been renewed several times over the last few decades. It basically sets up the process for us to share the home funds we get from, from HUD. Auburn is the member that's in charge of the consortium. Lewiston is, is this the, just a regular member. The only real change to this document this year is we historically, <coughs> the, we 10% for an administrative fee, it's allowed out of the entire um, home funds. Historically, we've gotten 4%, and then the other 6% were divided 3 and 3. This year, we're taking 4%, I'm sorry, 5%, and then splitting the remaining 5, 2.5, 2.5, as we're taking on some additional responsibility for the underwriting of some of the projects. Okay, very good. Any public discussion? None. Bring it back to the council. Council? Mr. Mayor, I, I would like to abstain from this. Um, it's not a, I, I don't view it as a true conflict, but I am uh, vice president of the Auburn Housing Development Corp, which is the CHODO that's identified in mm -hmm. the community housing development organization which is identified in the agreement and so even though I derive no personal benefit because I am an officer in that I Understand think it's cleaner to just abstain. Fair enough. Thank Fair you. Enough. Maybe I'll have a chance to vote. Any other comments? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, any other comments or questions on this? Okay. I would like to know a little bit more. I had a latter point about the Chodas and everything like that. I think that's interesting how we have some nonprofits that actually execute some of the mission. Yeah, outside a, of Auburn housing. Correct. There's a certain portion of the money from the home funds that are set aside um, by regulation to be used by HODO, so therefore we can help them either for operationally, but mostly for when they do projects that we approve of to put that money in to help out. Yeah. With that, any other comment? None. I'm going to ask for a vote. All those in favor? Oppose? Abstain? <laughs> Passes by vote of 6-1. Thank you. No, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Zero. I'm sorry, 6 zero, one. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is order 93-0627-2022. This is allocating 1.6 million of American Rescue Plan funds for the upgrades and or replacement of HVAC systems in our city on facilities. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion Councilor Gary, second from Councilor Whiting. All those in favor? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I skipped it a couple of <laughs> I was running right through that one. Uh, but the, I, the audio is back, so now I'm back in, in focus. Um, I'm going to open this up to the public for comment. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? This is, um, if you remember, a workshop we had uh, last meeting with an independent <coughs> auditor looking at our uh, HVAC needs. Mr. Titus? Good evening. Uh, Andy Titus, 24 Rubelite Lane. Uh, I know I can't ask a question, but hopefully you'll be answered. Are these uh, HVAC upgrades part of the five-year comprehensive uh, you know, capital improvement plan, or are any of these new that weren't on that plan? My concern is that I'd like to see ARPA funds being used to erase future mm -hmm. obligations. So I'd really like to see that first before anything new, a new addition, especially the ice arena, which I'm a little concerned that we just bought it a year or two ago, and now we have a major problem with uh, their HVAC system. So thank you. Um, is there anybody else in the public who would like to speak? I'll take some questions down, and I've got a feeling we could probably answer it because we have some staff. Any other comments? Uh, before we open up the council, Dan, would yes, you like to the, just talk a little bit? Yes, they are about within the five-year comprehensive, uh, comprehensive building maintenance plan. Um, they are listed in the CIP item. Yeah. The, yeah. Hate, the uh, Norway Savings Bank Arena, it's not a major renovation. It's basically when that system was turned online, it was never brought online properly, it was never commissioned, 
Um, one of the, essentially the chilling units has never been operational. So the building has continually, while they've maintained the ice surfaces, they're continually struggling to meet the HVAC needs, basically the air exchange and the, the cooling. So what this does, it's, gonna, it's essentially a recommissioning of the system to get that fourth unit online so that it operates efficiently, so that if, if you notice in the documents that were provided, the energy consumption has gone up by about 50% in that building um, over the past several years. And that's because they've maintained the surface of the ice, but to do that, you have to play with the system to do that, that it's not designed to operate that way. So they've made it work, and this is going to essentially make it work properly. Okay, I'm going to bring this back to the council. I'd like to open this up for the two councillors actually uh, brought this forth in the agenda. Councillor Gary, the councillor Whiting, if you have anything to add, we'll open this up to uh, council afterwards. Where'd you go? I, I just think these are, you know, worthwhile uh, expenditures, and uh, while it's unfortunate that, you know, on the ice arena, um, you know, that... That's a relatively new building, um, you know. It's it needs to be done, and uh, um, commissioning is something that's sadly neglected with new buildings. I imagine this building was probably commissioned. Yes. I suspect, and it's run very well. But buildings <coughs> that spend a lot of money on systems that aren't commissioned, oftentimes this kind of thing happens. So, um, you know, lesson learned, I guess. But. With, with Norway, we're not, we're not necessarily buying new equipment. We're, up, we're upsizing some of the fans, but the, the existing equipment is all staying. Councilor Gary, did you have anything, or did you want to let it set? It's basically the same thing on all the other projects. Hey, Council, any other comments or questions? While we're uh, waiting, Councilor Walker. Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, it's not that I don't believe what you're telling us here. Yep. But I, I would like to hear some of that stuff from a professional that deals with that. I have some professionals here with me tonight just for that That's case. good, because yep. I, I would <laughs> love to hear some. No, we're also, at this point, oh. yeah, I mean, I'd rather not do a Q&A as a workshop. On I don't want a Q&A, I just want someone to tell me that changing something at that arena is going to really do the... Fair enough. Yep, yeah. I can uh, invite up from... Mechanical Services and BIMS, who did the audit, um, mm -hmm. Don Bresnahan and Steve Ferguson. I don't know who you want to speak to Norway or. Uh, Steve will go ahead and. Hi, I'm Donald Bresnahan from Building Infrastructure Management Solutions. And to my right is Steve Ferguson. Steve is a independent licensed professional mechanical engineer who heads up the firm Aris. He was part of a group of engineers that look, went through all of the city buildings. So, Councilor, may I have your question again, please? Up at the Norway Savings Bank Arena, will you explain whatever it is? That the commissioning, how Brian that fourth explained. unit, essentially. Um, we had a chance. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll we let Mike in, will you, so yeah, I can, can hear you. you. How's that? Better? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now they can't hear you up back. Okay. I'll yell a little louder. All right. Yeah. We went through the building pretty extensively, and the commissioning that Dan is talking about is um, it will help the equipment run much more efficiently. Um, we did measure uh, a number of different things in the facility, and um, the exhaust rates in the um, in part of the facility that Dan mentioned is is pretty is low. It's about half of what design would currently have. So um, it is necessary, and the commissioning will help quite a bit to get that building efficiently running. Are you talking bringing in more air or taking out air or what? what yes, sir. It? Both of those actually. Yeah, it'll bring in more ventilation air to improve the carbon dioxide levels. Um, it'll also remove more air from the kind of steamy locker room area. Uh, to get that in inside ventilation to be better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a question? I do just have one Please. pretty basic question. Yeah. I apologize for my ignorance, but can any of this be an insurance claim at all? Mechanics liens, age of the building in Norway? Um, Warrantied item? Correct, which then the reduces the The city has taken ownership of the building, so I would guess 
No, but I'm not an alternative. So film. we've explored this uh, some, and uh, because it's not just this, there's been a couple other issues that we discovered. I think the Norway Savings Bank is probably six or seven, probably over six now, six years old. Um, there's been a few issues that have taken place. As, as we've explored it, we've realized we've hit a, a dead end each time. But it has been explored, so has been. yeah, <coughs> perfect. If I if I could, I, looking at this and listening, and I mean between the workshop, and I'd like to just make this as an option of the council. I'd recommend that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of separate projects here. We have CIP, we have five year plans, we have ARPA money for immediacy. If there is any such thing as immediacy with ordering an HVAC system from wherever um, in lead time, I'd, I'd like I'd, I'd recommend that we table this item. For a period of no longer than 90 days, allowing staff to go ahead and look at, you know, what is priority levels funding for, what could be waiting out to the next fiscal year for potential bond and so forth. And that's up to the council, but I would think that a decision made on a blanket statement at this point, um, based upon one report, no offense to you, but you're free. Uh, so sometimes we have to take that into consideration as well. Um, might be a little bit premature. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I, I, do, I would like to see the different projects broken out and, and, I, and prioritize the projects as opposed to one blanket. The I mean, original proposal I sent you at the last meeting had all of the projects listed. Yeah. These are the four priorities that are broken out right here. Um, there's another four that will be asked for funding in the next year's CIP, and there's another six after that. Um, these were primarily uh, focused on due to CO2 levels was one of the big drivers. If you can see, look at Norway, it's three times what it should be. Um, Hasty, the same thing. Hasty doesn't have AC, doesn't have heat in cer certain par uh, parts of the building in the winter because the pipes are so corroded. Understand, I understand. Okay, so yeah. we're moving. Mayor, if I, if if I could just say, I, I would just state, uh, Council, if, if you choose to table this for 90 days, you certainly have that, that ability. Um, I wouldn't um, put language on there that says staff would need to do any further work. I think uh, BIMS has done an exceptional job with evaluating all of our facilities and grading them and determining up what we need. And we did come forward with the priorities as mm -hmm. we've already done that. So yeah. I wouldn't put any language with that. If the council chooses they want to wait 90 days to give this consideration or to look at the ARPA funds before they go out, that, that's completely fine. Um, there is CIP process that will begin um, uh, probably around the first of the year. And so, as the mayor said, that could certainly go back to CIP, and we you will see these in the in the CIP project yeah. if it's not funded out of would, ARPA. Would any these of are these, priorities. Would any of these projects be able to get done this year with ARPA? With ARPA, we could go ahead and move forward with them. They wouldn't need to wait to go would as they we be, normally would do uh, under bonding in, in that process. Uh, you know, that would be part Normally. of the bid process. I think we would put it out to bid, and then uh, we could certainly make the bid process the with a. You know, this is the date we want to make sure that this project is completed. I think we have a couple that are priority, especially when we start taking a look at uh, the report <coughs> that came back regarding our Norway regarding carbon dioxide levels. Those are ones that we want to make sure that we're addressing those uh, immediately as we move forward. But, um, but like I said, if council wants to table it. That's fine. You're 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 going to see these come back before you. Again. I'm I'm not in favor of tabling it only because these are highly used places. We have children, we have people coming in every single day. I would rather spend a little bit of money and get it fixed and make sure it's done correctly so we can get back to the norm rather than tabling it for 90 days, potentially waiting for bonds and everything like that. If we have the opportunity, we should just do it. Well, I think we need to explore this because we just had a workshop talking about return on investment on appropriations. There is, from a dollar standpoint, did you actually, last workshop, we talked about cost savings efficiencies and what we'd be gaining on an annual basis. Do you have those numbers? I don't have hard numbers. I know at Norway it'd be significant um, because of the energy cost rate. The problem is we're getting, because of the deal we made with hydro and um, solar, we're getting a good rate on our electricity. So those costs have been absorbed by Norway, um, those 50% those increase in energy. So. This will reduce that, but it's not going to be, you're not going to see hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of savings in electricity. Um, it's more a level of comfort, a more level of carbon dioxide. I guess that's kind of gone. Yeah. 
Turn yeah. it over to John. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, if I, if I could just speak to the council and the mayor and the manager. I know that there's competition for funds, certainly in ARPA and CIP and Councilor Haas. I can't agree with you anymore. The return on investment is immediate. The amount of folks that use these public facilities on a daily basis, from a monetary perspective, I would expect to see a reduction of $50,000 annually in energy and operational expense. But folks, that's not what it's all about. We tried to put hard data with this independent engineering group in front of you to make a decision on public safety and public health. And what's the return on investment on that? It's immediate. And let's be clear, the return on investment is not necessarily a dollar and any dollar. It's whether or not that we do, and we have the power to bond outside of our normal bonding schedule and window to pay for something. Do we use cash or do we borrow the money? That's really where the return on investment is. It's not the, the worthiness of the project. It's not the, uh, the safety and health. This is at what pool of money do we use in order to accomplish the job in a prioritized fashion. So I want to make sure that's clear. This is business. And I've, I've done this before uh, <laughs> many times on commercial properties. Um, and it's always, do you, use, do you pay for it at a cash flow or do you borrow the money at a X rate and pay for it over years, basically matching up with the, as you know, the lifespan of the product in which you're purchasing. So I think that those are the questions. And I, it's not about whether or not it's doable or not, though that is something. But really the funding options in front of the council now, okay, whether do we spend 1.5 million on this right immediately now with ARPA money or do we use it with CIP or bond? Hence why the suggestion of table wouldn't make sense. Now, if we don't want a table, find a different alternate or funding source. What would be our, our rate, Ms. Eastman, right now, if we bonded for this 1.5 million? Um, when we did the school bond, it was 2.5. And it's gone up since then. It was up to four the last I heard. What do you think? You wanna, you wanna tell us what you think it's gonna be in six months? <laughs> Isn't so there another issue, Mr. Mayor? I mean, you know, Hasty has a failing system, which probably will not work this winter. Apparently it didn't work very well last winter. So if you table it for three months and then you do the procurement dance, which takes months, they're not fixing a heating system that needs to be fixed before winter until after the winter. So, so you have options. I would be opposed. The council, the council has options. You can do the whole amount in, with ARPA, how long does it take, uh, Jill, to do a, a supplemental bond? For let's say we wanted to go out to bond for 1.5 million. The process. Well, it's a month, two month long process for the county to begin with. It has to be advertised two weeks before mm -hmm. the public hearing. Then there's a public hearing and then there's another meeting, a meeting, it has to have two meetings. Mm -hmm. And then it takes me time. We have to do the um, official statement, all that. So what's the most urgent pro project right now? That's question one. Yeah, I, would, I, I don't know. If, if everything's a priority, nothing is. So the well, these is, are the four priorities. That's the problem. It's all four equal priorities. So this is, I mean, I do have, again, my job is not, and it may sound that I'm, I'm countering everything you're saying, but it's not. Please don't take it that way. My job is to provide intelligence to the council to make a decision. You have multiple pathways here to accomplish what we all need to accomplish, which is healthy buildings that are operational when our, when our patrons or citizens need it. Um, I will say right now that you could use a par partial ARPA money for a top priority issue, whether it be hasty, okay, and get that going quickly. It is a shelter, after all. That is a priority project. And then look at bonds for the other three. So that is where I think you need to look and weigh the pros and cons, because you don't want to spend all your cash in your pocket on one capital expense. That's why we have CIP process and bonding. Would we be able to do all four right now? Yes. We have the, the personnel to be able to accomplish all four projects? We'd be contracting the work, but yes. So, I mean, the, and the contractors are committed and? Yes, they're, they're aware of the fund. Okay. Any other comments or questions or motions? Councilor Walker. Well, I, I know one thing for sure. I went through enough different classes to understand if you're not breathing the proper air and you don't have the proper ventilation, people can go down on the ice quicker than you can blink an eye. 
And that scares me when you, when you sit here as professionals and tell me that we do not have the proper air flowing in there. And I, I can relate back to Massachusetts. They went through some pretty big suits up there because they were told the same thing you're telling us, and they did not take care of it. And all you need is someone that has a little hyper heart, and because he can't breathe enough, he goes down. And that could be us tomorrow. And I think uh, to pick up on your point, uh, Council Walker, when um, SR ARPA was created by the federal government, uh, projects that we've seen all over the state of Maine have been wholeheartedly focused on ventilation issues. So the, although bonding, and I understand listening to the mayor, great point about uh, which pot of funds uh, you might want to pay for something, but ESSER ARPA was specifically targeted for ventilation projects. Can I ask, your business model is to provide free consultations on HVAC? Um, plant, engineering plants? It's actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was, um, that was brought up as uh, last time that we did a free audit. Um, our group is actually a privately held uh, investment group and we make investments, spend significant amounts of money to try to bring awareness to cities, towns, hospitals, and school districts about not only ventilation air, but failing HVAC systems. We targeted uh, Auburn, Maine, because it wasn't um, Falmouth or Freeport or those that uh, perhaps are a little bit wealthier, and we were impressed with the, the growth model. So, um, so you, you targeted Auburn specifically for some of those reasons. Did yes. You, when, you, when you did this, so you actually charge municipalities for these audits? Um, we make selected investments, and we do not charge um, we go forward with a lot of them, and for whatever reason, they uh, the project might be held up, and we don't get paid for that. So, so you, you do get. What do you mean you do you do get paid for the audits? No, we do not. So we, in general, do you never charge for your audits? No, we do not charge for the audit. No, uh, and because that can be a barrier to doing the complexity and the depth of the audit. If you saw what uh, Dan and Derek had reviewed in the presentation that we did last time, placing data loggers in all of the city buildings and recording CO2 levels and actually measuring air. So you're a nonprofit that's funded by philanthropical sources, or? We are a privately held uh, group uh, of investors that um, we do not make a profit now. Privately held group of investors? Privately are held. Are the investors part of the HVAC industry? Uh, actually, you we do. Disclose your investors. We we do um, we do complete audits of building facilities, so everything from the roof to the basement. So that does include HVAC vendors. It does. Okay. I make a, Councillor Gary. Dude, did you want to finish? No, this? no, go, go. I need I need a minute anyway. Okay. Thank you. I agree with what the good counselors have said. Now's the time to do it. I know weather conditions, temperatures also affect the environmental, I mean, what you guys are saying that we're trying to fix. So now's the time to do it, especially with the warmer weather, because that can condense whatever people's breathing. And also, in the long run, it's going to, cost, it's going to save us money if things are running properly. If they're accurate. I have, I'm sorry, but I have serious doubts about the authenticity of the study, and I'm, I'm going to give you some professional Q&A here, if you would. Um, there's an old adage that you get what you pay for, and I'm sorry, but at this point, I, I really do think a second opinion is needed. Based upon the funding mechanism that funds your corporation and what your goals are, um, it just gives me considerable doubt and potential conflict of interest. I'm sure that the people, the companies that are going to be receiving the RFPs and do this work are probably some of, you, of your investors. I, I think a second opinion, if you'd like one, is, is welcome because uh, all of the people that have worked on the audit have been independent of our organization. So we're more than happy to have our, our work peer reviewed. Okay. Good. <clears throat> it's up to the council that there's one other option for payment to approve this with ARPA funds today 
to get the ball rolling, to move into the process of bonding this, and then substitute the ARPA funds with the bond at a latter point, 30, 60, 90 days out, whenever that's complete. So in other words, displacement. Start it off with that, then reimburse it with bond. I'll make that motion. Yeah. Got a motion from Councillor Hawes. Do I have a second? No second? I'll second. We have a second from Councillor Motion. So we have a motion on the floor now to approve the order, as stands, paying it with ARPA money, with the knowledge that we will work on the bond and replace the ARPA money with bond money at a point in time. Mr. Mayor, uh, I'd like the manager to chime in to make sure we're not doing something playing around. I'm sure. So I think that what you're ultimately doing is you're, you are allocating this. However you use bond money for either this project or another project, um, we could we can look at that, and what you can always do is you can take and reallocate those funds back out. I think there, it is, um, it would need to be explored. I need to make sure that our grant writer uh, runs this through the U.S. Treasurer um, because these are funds that are being regulated very closely. And so, um, so that is, that's, that's one thing we would want to make sure that's, that's taken care of. So uh, you can move the motion if that's what the council wants to do, um, we would then explore it. If that needed to come back to you, we would then bring the, that back to you for, uh, for a change. Councilor Staples. Uh, yeah, in the, in the workshop today, we, we discussed having $3 million of ARPA funds remaining. Is that before or after this? Before. before. So it would be 1.4 after. Any other debate, conversation? If not, I'm going to ask for a vote on the motion. So, Councilor Hollis, did you have something? Well, I was just going to say that it accomplishes both things. Is and I I understand it's a it's a free consultation, but if they're saying that there are these negative impacts on the community right now and they need to be addressed immediately, then we say yes. We go ahead and we get them started, but then we do have that open door of how do we refinance this? How do we pay ourselves back? So we're not left with 1.4 of ARPA money, and we can reallocate that to something else and use the bond to pay for these immediately. That's a win-win in my book. Mm -hmm. Or we can just do it as is, spend the ARPA money, and then not worry about having to find a way to replace this money and to use this money for another project, because then we can use the money for that we don't switch around for whatever we need because whatever the project might be may not be opera qualified. So you could uh, do that or you could just pass a motion and then remember the reallocation and bond votes will be public and have to come in front of this uh, council again in the future and that's where a determination on that can be made. Professor Martin? Um, my first priority is that uh, you know, obviously the, the facilities are safe um, I know Hasty is woefully inadequate. Um, I know that there's a lot of kids that plan on playing basketball there this winter. Um, and I, uh, I listen very closely to Councillor Walker and his years of experience and his comments on um, Norway Savings Bank Arena. So um, I love the opportunity of some flexibility in pursuing other funding. It, my top priority is that this is taken care of. And, uh, Dan's been doing a lot of work and he's come before us several times and he's just trying to really impress upon us the, the time sensitive nature um, of these facilities. And my, my knee jerk is always, yeah, let's table and think longer, but clock's ticking, right? And winter's coming. Um, so my priority is that we fund this and that compromise does that. It gives us flexibility. And we may default into a position where we can't bond out and the ARPA funds are allocated to this. So I, I like that compromise because I know one way or the other this project's going to be funded. Uh, Mr. Manager? So that we're not going back and forth on how it will be allocated, maybe the best uh, motion would be that uh, the council moves forward with uh, proceeding with uh, the bid and um, implementation of a new HVAC system for these four projects at your next meeting we will come back to you with how do you allocate those funds. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I 
com I completely agree with that, uh, Mr. City Manager. I, I think that it's unwise for us to vote on something where we don't even know the legality of it. And ARPA, uh, and if all federal funding is really complicated, I have 40 years of experience with that. And whenever you think it's going to be one way, you may be told it's the app complete and utter opposite. So, um, you know, I think city manager's suggestion is a good one. Okay, so from a protocol standpoint, we'll have to vote down the existing motion. And so I'm going to take a vote at this point. I'm sorry, Sue, did you have something? Um, unless Councillor Haas and whoever okay. made the second would like to withdraw that motion. Unless you'd like to withdraw the motion. I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw. Okay, very good. So it's clean slate. Um, Councillor Whiting, I'm going to ask you to uh, make the motion that the manager just gave you, because I just told totally him. <laughs> My mind is blanking. I apologize. Hey, you know, I'm in the mayor. I'm an old I guy. <laughs> um, Mr. Manager, can you give us a language again on that one, please? I would I'm just uh, direct the city manager to uh, move forward with uh, the bid and um, the bid project for the HVAC system that identifies the four priority um, initiatives. I would make that motion as stated by the city. I've manager. got a motion. I'll second. Second. I'll second. Second from Councillor Morin. Any debate? None. Bringing it up for a vote. All those in favor? Yeah. It passes 7 0. Thank you. And make sure you have the vendors stop calling me because they've been calling me about getting on the bid list here for a while. <laughs> Tell them to, it's probably best to wait till after the vote. It's not that funny. Thanks for your support, Mayor, for uh, making it. Thank you very much. So next on the agenda, we have Order 95-0627-2022, allocating $100,000 of American Rescue Plan Act Point funds. Order. I did. I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you. Amending Order 137-12062022. Previously adopted by the City Council on December 6, 2021. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Councillor Staples. Do second. I have a second? Councillor second. Walker. Open this up for public comment. Any public comment? None being. I'll bring it back to the Council. Council? Discussion? Comment. Oh, public comment. Oh, please. I'm sorry. Dillingham Hill Road, and I read the agenda, but I, I don't remember what this was. And so you look and you ask if we have a question. Tell me, what is this order from December 6th? Yeah, let me pull it up. Hold on one second. Please. <coughs> it's up on the screen. Oh, I can't read that. Uh, it's up on the screen. Basically, allow the funding. This is a okay. Allowing the funding to allocate a joint okay. consortium with the City of Lewis and Auburn Water District. That's nice. Stand up a municipal and fiber network. This is something that we passed in December. Sure, sure. Dark sure. fiber. Yep. Sure. No. This is one of those things, as Councillor Whiting stated, it's good. to be compliant with federal laws. So we're adding the red text, which is right. uh, and or other cybersecurity or policy software upgrades. Got it. I don't print the 147 pages, and it's hard. So if you could just give a little bit. I try. I try, everyone. Sometimes I usually hit the hit the big ones, like I've done tonight. Give me a little credit for that. Oh, yeah. The little ones that are adjusting verbiage, I will give you a hint. If you go online to the agenda and you touch any order number on the front page one of the agenda, it will hyperlink to the exact text in which we're discussing. And so you don't have to thumb through all 147 pages. So it's a little, little insider trade secret there. So now we have it up on the screen. Council, do we have any debate or discussion? Um, and I, so the way I read this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're, we're putting in a fiber network, and the additional cybersecurity and policy allotments are for that fiber network, and they're not, for instance, cybersecurity systems for City Hall. It's both. So you, it's, it's to make sure that the language that we're allocating allows for not just the fiber, which we're still working and trying to work that consortium out, but it is to also enhance our current system for protections that we're hoping to be able to move forward with. So I, I know that cybersecurity is, is expensive. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just worried that the, the cybersecurity portion of this would eat up that $250,000 pretty quickly and that 
my, my priority here is the fiber network. Uh, I just want to make sure that that still happens and that it's not uh, downgraded in any way uh, for the purpose of cybersecurity. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we bring um, the IT director in uh, for an update on that um, in the near future. Any other conversations or comments? And I'm being asked for a vote at this time. All those in favor? Passes 7 0. Now, I'll go to order 95-0627-2022. Allocating $100,000 of American Rescue Plan Act funds for the op box and kayak rental kiosk, as explained earlier tonight during the workshop. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Councilor Staples, second Councilor Walker. Open this up to the public for comment. Opportunity boxes are a main-made box, portable, and this one will be used to transport uh, that's the second one, but keep that up. Uh, will be used to transport uh, recreational activities and games, kiosk information throughout the city on an as needed basis, festivals, etc. Second one is this rent fund, kayaks, app, credit card, disclosure, PDFs, paddles. Want a kayak? Go down to Great Falls, get the kayak. Kayak, bring it back. Um, upfront expenditure is roughly 16000 on the kayak. Um, but there is a rev share on revenues 50-50 between the vendor and the city of Auburn on the go forward, guaranteed five years. So that's an update for the public. Public, would you like to talk on this or discuss? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May I amend this before public comment? I'd rather not, if you could just okay. use public comment first. Anybody from the public like to comment? No? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Council Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Based on the excellent workshop presentation on this product about the canoes and stuff, and then rereading some of that information also put out by this company, Opbox, and their village comment, or the, yes, pop ups. I would like to amend this order to add another $100,000 in order to buy as many of these pop-ups as we can, because these will be great for pop-up businesses in uh, around the parking lot we have out here. They're movable. We can also take them to uh, Great Falls Plaza, set them up there. They can also be moved if we needed to put on events at Anniversary Park. The great things are we can promote small businesses in these different little kiosk shops and also nonprofits like the high schools or uh, the PAL Center. Any of these groups can take. So we have a, we have a motion yes. that we can get into the debate. Okay, okay thank you. But we have a motion on the floor to add $100,000 from the ARPA account, uh, excuse me, to enhance or increase the funding <clears throat> for uh, this order, which is currently at $100,000. So that would be a total of $200,000. Got a second Councillor Haas. Okay, now we'll open this up uh, as amended. So, and I, and I will say all those, I, I want to remind the Council, I think Councillor Gary and Councillor uh, Walker are here. When we first talked about ARPA funds, one of the things that came up as an idea for expenditure was a Christmas Village and Festival Plaza. If you look at the German Christmas Village, Austrian Christmas Villages, historically in the US and especially in Europe, they were where small vendors can actually set up and shop coordinated with city events, um, leads into New Year's uh, for craft beer vendors, food vendors, and so forth. And then again, it can be used for numerous myriad things. Uh, the nearest one we have is Boston. And there's been talk from Gritties as well as other local businesses who would like to see this and help sponsor it. So there is a ROI, financial ROI, though it's almost incalculable at this point. Uh, so I just want to give you a little historic background. This is not something that just came about. This is something that's been talked about for three years now. Councilor Staples. Yeah, I, I really like where uh, Councilor Gary was going with this. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that this is the intent, original intent of these uh, when we were presented this in the workshop, but uh, you know, I really think that there's an opportunity here for the city of Auburn for some economic development and encouraging some small business owners in, in, in some sort of a business incubator fashion. You, you build a small business, the, the initial startup costs are so much lower on something like this. And, and, and you take a business and you, and you build it up and then you've got somebody building something in the downtown. This is, an, this is a knockdown, awesome project. We, we need to do this and we need to do more of it. Councilor Moran. 
And I'd also like to add uh, for anybody in the public that's watching this that didn't observe the workshop um, that Upbox is a main owned and run company and I believe there it was either Waldeboro or Nobleboro. Mm -hmm. um, and these Upboxes are manufactured from recycled plastics, which I think is definitely a positive as well. Yeah, Upboxinfo.com, great website if anybody wants to look at this. Um, yeah, I think this is a good opportunity and recyclable with, ex not recyclable, a huge lifespan, hundreds of years. So because of the construction, it's a lot. We were initially looking at sheds, wooden sheds that might be questionable in surviving a move from one location to another. I think this is a much better alternative. Is there any other comments or debate on this? Yeah. Yes, I, I don't mean to be a wet blanket, but I, I'd like to ask the city manager about staffing uh, demands uh, just because you know we didn't get into it but for example the recreation department dealing with fishing rods that's great and you know get kids out fishing and so on somebody's going to be on disentangling lines I mean there are some labor costs involved in this and so I just want to get a reaction my preference would be to just approve the order as is see how it works see how staff deals with it and then wait and probably expand. I think we probably will, but I just like a little reaction on staffing. Yeah. Just just on the staffing piece, I think that um, we would need to really work, when we talk about the REC um, initiative, that's where we're gonna need to work with partners, uh, the recreation board, uh, to talk about some volunteers, because what we the worst thing that would happen would be that we would have this in place, it would be locked and nobody would ever have access to it. Um, so we want to make sure that on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that that is open. We've got a volunteer that's ensuring that they're monitoring the equipment that's going out. Uh, and the equipment that I'm talking about is more like the, you know, the cornhole, uh, whatever other activities that can play, be, take place down there. Uh, I think that the uh, fly fishing that um, Jay was talking about and some of the other fishing initiatives, that's where we really look at, like Council Moran was talking about, how do we partner with the discovery kind of initiative to make some of that work? And then that would be able to make sure that that's a, um, something that's scheduled. And, you know, Jay has talked to probably four or five staff members that all fly fish, that all want to participate. They, you know, if you know anyone who fly fishes, they like to spread the word about getting out and fly fishing. And so they want to be part of that. So, so staffing that, that's how we would look at that. I think there's two approaches to that. Uh, when it comes to the, the larger initiative, um, I, think, I think we could go ahead and appropriate that and we would move forward with getting that. Uh, that would probably buy us some time to really get this ready for that next holiday event so that we could, we could uh, potentially move pretty quickly on that. We have a lot of infrastructure in Festival Plaza now, and so a lot of that we need to take a look and see what do we need to make that happen so that we can kind of create that, that village kind of uh, image that I was looking quickly for a photo, but um, you know, that could take place in Festival Plaza. So I, I think we're good. Jay, I don't know if you need to add anything. No, I was popped up here thinking I might need to add, but that's, I, I think Councilor Whiting, you brought up an excellent point. And so we have been talking with Jeremy in, in REC, whose staff would have to handle this. Um, the idea being that some of the outfitters themselves would actually teach the fly fishing, that type of stuff. The uh, staff that would have to man these at certain times, those would be for specific events and specific times. Um, and uh, then again, when it comes to the um, you know Christmas village or something, then it's staffed by whoever the vendor is. And then um, in the winter, if we move at least one of them to the PAL Center, then that would be PAL Center staff. Uh, so we've, we've put it together saying, how do we staff these? And, and I think we've got it, got it covered. Is there any other questions while we have yeah. Councilor Staples? You know, one thing that uh, jumps out at me here really is, Jay, Jay really is talking about a separate thing from what I'm thinking. I, I wonder if what Jay wants to do is, is an awesome idea. But I think we, we really could use a separate order to do some of this pop-up shop business type stuff to, to buy another one. Maybe what we really should do here is to just buy the one that Jay wants. If, I will, okay. So I just want to remind you of what we knew. There's an ordering window. 
And you're buying one Jay wants, and then looking at what Councillor Gary is talking about is smaller ones that are smaller in scope, and specifically used for outside rental for small business startups. It could be a nominal rental of ten dollars a day. So I, I mean, it can be used on the same order with direction uh, that the manager and Jay will work with. But I think you have an ordering window here because if you don't hit it for the second time, you're pushing this out for a year plus, according to what Jay said earlier. Councillor Morn. Uh, Jay, hypothetically, we move from 100,000 allocated to 200,000. What does that mean for quality of units, number of units? Like, what, what does that look like to you? The, um, there's a couple of things. One, I wanted to address uh, Staples, and then as part of addressing Staples, I think it helps to answer your, your question. So um, back with the previous city council, and that's my mistake for not realizing and thinking this is the same uh, group of people, Originally, when we talked about alt blocks or, or something for the downtown revitalization plan, we had talked about using storage containers. And when we looked into those, it was like $100,000 per box to do it. So then we came up with this alt box. And probably during the workshop, I should have shown this kind of village um, that, that they put together in their uh, presentation. So, They've got multiple uses, and that is one of the things that we're talking about, the, to be able to do pop-up shops. And whether that be in Anniversary Park at one point, and then Festival Plaza another, um, with the idea of when we do those pop-up shops, if there's a coffee shop that, that uh, operates out of one of them, that we work to segue them into a brick and mortar um, Location. So I think we're all on the similar page. Um, and my initial ask was 100,000 because, you know, honestly, I spoke with city management and I said, you know, I'd like to get a couple hundred thousand, but, you know, city council's got a lot of decisions to make and they suggested 100,000. But I think um, Councillor Gary, who had been working on this for years, and Mayor, one of the few times I think we who are eye to eye on things. Um, <laughs> we like this. They, they, they upped it to where I actually wanted to be. Um, Good enough. So I think we're on a similar. And then yours was the quality of boxes as well. Yeah, what's the, the quality? Timeline. What's the mix? Like, what's the quantity? Because yeah. I can imagine there's smaller boxes and they can yeah. be used for certain things and yeah. something that's a little yeah. more built out. And, and just to add on to that, is there any opportunity for private rentals of this from the city as a yeah. revenue stream? Yeah, we, we could do private rentals of them as, as a revenue stream. I think what it would do is offset costs. I don't know if we'd get a lot of revenue out of it. Um, our thought is that we will, um, the, the size boxes you can order, they like to keep the width to the width of what would fit on like a tractor trailer truck. It can be narrower, but sure. they don't want to go any longer than that. And then the length is really um, determined by what you really want to do, but essentially the biggest you'd normally do would be like a tractor trailer length. So but a lot of these would probably be somewhere between, you know, 10 feet wide and 15, 20 feet long or something like that. There's one that they do that's for craft breweries and it's basically a small walk-in cooler. And then that way you can have multiple breweries off of um, you know, a handful of taps. Our thought, our idea is that we would keep these boxes uh, fairly small, like 10 foot by 15, and that we put the rack system in there that's adjustable and can accommodate a lot of things and then some electricity as well as security cameras. That way it can get changed out for whatever you're using it for. We'll probably stay away from the food and concession stands, and the reason for that is as soon as you add a kitchen or any of that stuff, the price goes through the roof. And we've actually had quite a number of, um, of food trucks register licenses past year in the city of Auburn. So I think if we create a pop-up situation um, that we would invite a food truck to join in. Sure, when, when I think of uh, opportunities for rental, I think of a brew fest over, over in Lewis and right, Baxter is sponsoring it and maybe mm -hmm. they want to rent one of these and that's where they run all of their apparel out of. Mm -hmm. Just something that really just right. comes to mind. 
Yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, you could think of crafts uh, fairs. So in a Christmas Village concept, which is a business incubation concept, what happens is it's open every Wednesday, Friday and evenings, Saturday during the day. That's when you have Santa come, hot cocoa, buy nonprofits. But people are coming there because they're shopping at the craft fairs. And then they go to Gritty's and they go to our local businesses. So it becomes this high walkability neighborhood that is a destination for four weeks around Christmas from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Um, and then it's repurposed for New Year's Eve in the plaza, for beer vendors or what have you, food vendors, and then it's moved. So uh, I, there's a lot of great options. I think um, worst case, we can't get it. It comes back and the money isn't spent on this. It comes back to us for general allocation through ARPA expenditures later on. But at least we have the flexibility. And I want, I'm very curious to see about economies of scale right there is a great example of a small one, not the recreational one, but the additional $100,000. You're talking a 10 by 12, probably, uh, set up, highly durable. But then, at that point, you have them forever. It's a good sunk resource, business incubator. So that's what we're discussing. I think we get it back, we allot, we look at economy of scale, see what we can afford, what kind of bulk discount we can get. If it doesn't work out, report back to us, no harm, no foul, but at least we tried for this holiday season. Right. Yeah, so just a thought there. Um, any other comments before I ask for a vote? The, the only other thing I would suggest is um, perhaps in the wording we say the, for the kayak rentals and op box and associated costs, in case like when we go to purchase a, these op boxes and a couple other things, there might be some costs mixed in there that weren't specific to the op box. We're just amending this to increase it from $100,000 to $200,000. Okay. So okay. all your existing language stays. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, no other questions? Ask for a vote at this time. All those in favor of the motion as amended, please raise your hand. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Um, point of order. Did you get a vote on the amendment first? No. You need a vote on the amendment first. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Did we skip? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's where I was going. Okay. It's, it's the AC in here is not working now. The... <laughs> um, so that was a motion as now adopted. Okay, final, uh, final debate on the actual amended motion. Uh, do we have any debate on the final amended motion? No? I'll ask for a vote then. Thank you, Sue. All those in favor of the motion as amended? Pass the 7 0. Okay, now we have um, is ordinance 17 06 272022, readopting the ward maps and descriptions that were adopted on 3 17 2014. Using the 2020 census block reference, it's a public hearing at first reading. Do I have a motion? Motion to accept. Second. Motion, Councilor Walker. Second, from Councilor Staples. Uh, by state law, upon redistricting, excuse me, upon uh, the census results, we have to redistrict our wards um, if they are in more than a 10% deviation of population. We do not have that. The council discussed in workshop to maintain the ward integrity as is, where is. So we're in compliance with state law. Um, that's where we're at. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak on this? No? Um, we're going to back to uh, the council. Council? No further discussion? We workshop this pretty well. Okay. Ask for roll call vote on the first reading, please. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Whiting? Yes. Councillor Hawes? Yes. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Morin? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Staples? Yes. Pass the 7 0. Open this up to the last open session of the night. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue directly related to city business, which was not on tonight's agenda. Members would like to speak. Please step up to the podium, give us your name, address, and limit your comments to three minutes. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to council then. Um, reports. Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. That op ops box, Jim Lynch from Shepley Street, that ops box sounds great. In fact, uh, there's a French teacher at Edward Little High School that has encouraged his students to build these little houses. And I'm sure you, they could build a lot of those op boxes for a lot less money than $200,000. And it would be a great, it would be a great project for the kids and the community. The second thing is, I'm all for these op boxes, so long as you don't put them on Lake Street and Shepley Street. Thank you. <laughs> Your road's not wide enough. Uh, just for. 
we I did talk with uh, I did talk with the instructor over there. Uh, they can only push out because of uh, kids and so forth one per year. Okay, but it's definitely an option to keep adding on to it. But that's a great program. Yeah. Hi, Susan Brown, Dillingham Hill. So I just wanted to tag on for Mr. Lynn, Mrs. Lynch about the situation with the neighborhoods. I used to live in that neighborhood before I moved out to Dillingham, and. It, it's, I think, any established neighborhood that can envision having a 12-unit apartment and or, you know, one, a, a business that, you know, might be on, that you just don't want next door, really, really affects people's quality of life. I think the neighborhoods that are um, now being in, impacted by the Court Street development, um, I think, you know, we do need housing for the many, um, but I question, and I will continue to question, the sensibility of that. We've got one of the two, three separately built areas, you know, adjacent to, across the street, um, that, you know, now look on this apartment situation. That doesn't mean I'm a NIMBY. That doesn't mean I don't think apartments should exist. I do, I do. I, the, the last neighborhood I lived in before moving to Maine was a really nice mixed residential neighborhood in the city of Buffalo, adjacent to a Frederick Walmstead Park. It had higher income, lower income. It had with the wealthiest of Buffalo, the Jacobs family, big, 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 big family bucks right on the, the, the border of the park. By building triples and doubles, what, how many seconds am I? Am I about? You're good. To? You're good. I'm, good. I'm pretty good. At <laughs> I know you. You like to watch it, though. I. <laughs> um, so I just I really question. I mean, I know you wouldn't mind if a pig farm was built next to your house because you, when we out in Dillingham Hill, almost had a marijuana farm on the corner of an established neighborhood. You you mentioned that to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could have been. Use. It could have been a, a pig farm. Yep, right, been. right. Well, allowed use in planned areas are, you know, you, you like them to go hand in hand. I just, I just think that you didn't think a lot about the, the city's residents that are already here in their homes. And I definitely think that if you built some duplexes and some, maybe some row houses, you would have seen a totally different reaction from your community rather than these big giant apartment buildings, which I don't see as walkable. walkable. Anybody else from the public like to speak? And again, I encourage you to come to the community oh, meeting so we can talk about all the big apartment blocks that have been built in your neighborhood since this took effect two and a half months ago. Mm. Maureen O'Brien, 42 Winter Street in Auburn. I want to talk about the money, the $10,000 that was allocated to cover PR for the lake issue. I understand the money went to a friend or associate of uh, Councillor Milks. That doesn't smell good to me. Um, you should be allocating money to Excuse support. Excuse me, I'm sorry, this is. I, I am I'm talking, this is my time. I get my three minutes. Actually, your time is to talk about city business. I am Auburn talking Auburn about business. city business, the spending of money for funding PR for the lake. You should be funding an equal amount of money for people who want to have a different opinion than the than the mayor. Ma ma Thank you. Okay, so I have to set the record straight on this. This open our public discussions for city business. Auburn Water District is not a city department. It doesn't matter. It's the, city. It, the city council nor the city staff authorize any expenditures at the Auburn Water District. It is their own entity. They can do what they want to do. So this is for city business. Thank you for your comment. I would encourage you to go to the Auburn Water District meetings. In turn, they have public comment that you can talk there. Is there anybody else in the public that would like to comment? Okay, we'll bring it back to reports. Uh, Mayor's report, uh, nothing except for the 4th of July is next week, Liberty Festival. So please, everybody, enjoy Independence Day. Councilors, start on this side. Councilor Gary? None at this time. Councilor Whiting? Uh, attended the World Refugee Celebration on Monday. Um, 
and saw Governor Mills for the fourth week in a row. I said, we have to stop meeting like this. Um, and also met Dr. Shaw, very nice man, very intelligent, and very funny. Uh, so it was worth the trip just for that. That's it. Thank you. Nothing at this time. Nothing for me. Nothing, thank you. I have a couple things. Uh, one, I'll, I'll speak for Larry Pelletier, that uh, scooping your dog's poop up is very important to Larry. He does a lot of walking around the city, and he does a lot of it for people. And don't flush your pet ways down, whatever you do, especially your toilets at home. And uh, make sure you uh, do not compost your pet waste as well. It's uh, full of diseases and kill people. Do not put your pet waste in any catch basins because we pay a lot of money for the water that runs through that plant across the river. So Larry would love to thank you for making sure you take care of your pets, pick up your own waste, and dispose it the right way. Tuesday night, I have a meeting at Rowley's Diner, 6 o'clock. This Tuesday, Glenn Holmes will be our uh, evening speaker. You're welcome to come down, ask any questions that you'd like to ask. He has all the answers there, and uh, <laughs> come on down and enjoy yourself. The other one is Thursday night, Neighborhood Watch at 6th Street Congregational Church, sponsored by the Auburn Police Department. We have been doing this for approximately 10 years, and we get approximately 17 people to show up every month. It would be nice if we could get 70 people. So you don't have to live in New Auburn to come to the Neighborhood Watch, because we love to hear what anyone has to talk about from the city of Auburn and what your neighborhood is like, how nice it is, how nice it isn't, what goes wrong, what we should do that's right, we'll listen to all of it. So you're welcome. Six o'clock, Sixth Street Congregational Church. Thank you. Councilor Staples. Uh, yeah, I attended the, the planning board meeting last week on the uh, last Tuesday. Uh, I thought it was a, a well attended meeting and I want to encourage residents who have additional concerns to uh, discuss about the zoning to attend one of the neighborhood meetings on the 12th of the 13th that Mayor Levesque mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Um, really looking forward to more public input on this. I think it's really important that we come up with, uh, you know, community consensus on what to do here. Uh, I also uh, wanted to tell everybody that there's a neighborhood meeting on Wednesday this week, the 29th, at the Auburn Senior Community Center uh, at 6 o'clock to discuss uh, Gamage Avenue area um, and some of the different things that are happening around road road plan improvements in that area. Uh, I think it's uh, going to be attended by city staff and uh, PD. Um, also, there's another planning board meeting tomorrow night. I, I, I think that it's, it's important. There's not a council representative on the planning board, but I think it's really important that we, we publicize those at council meetings. Uh, lots of things on the agenda. Check it out. Um, and uh, it'll be right here. So that's all I have. Thanks. Let's make sure you're there before 9 o'clock, though. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll entertain him. On to reports. Jill, we got a finance report before we accept. Mr. Mann. Oh, did I skip you? It's all right. I have a couple things. So thanks, mm. Mayor. Okay. I suppose so, so. Uh, we are wrapping up our fiscal year. Uh, that will end on Thursday. Uh, just for our council to be aware uh, as we move forward with. Uh, wrapping up accounts and uh, projects that are underway. Finance department is um, moving forward and working collaboratively with all the directors to ensure all the uh, wrapping up of that, those books are completed. Assessing department is working hard to uh, provide you with numbers regarding commitment. You will see that soon. As well as our grant writer, we have several grants that require uh, multiple uh, year-end uh, reporting that is also underway so that's that's what we transition to come uh, the end of June beginning of July beginning of July kicks off our new budget year 
Uh, so a lot of a lot of initiatives underway. That also, if we have collective bargaining units, that's when some of our collective bargaining units, uh, their contracts end. Uh, we have two collective bargaining units that their contract is ending. That's the MSEA uh, contract as well as the fire contract. So. Um, Brian Wood, our assistant city manager, is leading that with a team of staff and negotiations. Those negotiations are underway. They will not be signed before the end before the end of the fiscal year, but negotiations are moving forward. Uh, that's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Phil. And we're going to go on to the finance report. Jill, what is there anything you'd like to lead us up on? We have your memo here in our packet. Yeah, you do. And um, like Phil said, fiscal year end is. Thursday, so I've been watching uh, the line items and actually ran all the reports. And I think we're going to end up probably just about as well as we did last year. Um, that's what it looks like right now. So um, I'm not concerned. I mean, some of the line items are over, but overall the budget will probably come in under budget and revenues are going to come in over. So it's a good thing. I'll get a motion to accept and place on file the May 2022 final monthly financial report. Motion to accept. Second. Councilor Walker, I say for Councilor Milk. Uh, any discussion, questions about the finance report? Councilor Staples. Yeah, I just want to recognize that I know that this is a really busy week for you. And the next week, even busy. And, and, and thank you. It's a lot of good work, really. I, I, this is my favorite time of year, actually. <laughs> I love it, so <laughs> can't help myself. <laughs> Councilor Walker. I was going to say the same thing. Thank you, Joe, for everything you do. It's like Christmas for Joe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other platitudes for Joe? No, nothing. Mr. Mayor, Tell would you again. announce the two meeting times once again? Oh, the community meetings? Please. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's going to be a July 12th, 530 Walton Cafeteria. Wednesday, July uh, 13th at Fairview uh, Gym, 530 again, 530 to 7. And we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? I'm sorry, I'll, I, please keep your hands up. All those in favor? Yeah. Pass to 7 0. Just flip. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, next, we have an executive session for economic development matter pursuant to 1 MRSA section 405. Do I have a motion? Motion to move. Second. I have a motion from Councillor Walker, second from Councillor Staples. Um, just. Uh, but a note, there will be no action after these executive items, excuse me, agenda items. So we'll be going dark and not coming back in other than for adjournment. Um, all those in favor of executive session, please raise your hand. It passes. Okay. We're now in executive session.